Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the June 15th meeting of the Winchester Select Board. My name is Michael Betancourt. I serve as chair. Joining me tonight are select board members uh, Jackie Welch, Mariano Golubov, Amy Shapiro, uh, and Vice Chair Susan Verdicchio. Um, town man Manager uh, Lisa Wong uh, is with us, and um, uh, Assistant Town Manager um, Mark Tugood, uh, and our Town Engineer uh, Beth Rudolph. Um, so, um, I think that we um, have a couple of um, items on our agenda. I also, um, I see Mr. Cavino there, um, and um, um, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll ask if um, before we kind of get into things, um, if there are matters from the audience. And um, Mr. Cavino, I, I I don't know if you have questions for the select board um, regarding the dining policy or, or, or anything else, I'll, um, I'll hear from you or uh, any other members of the audience. And Jim, you've got to unmute. There we go. Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, members of the board, I'm, I'm actually here to act, ask permission uh, to uh, to install or implement more seating over at the Black Horse. Uh, during our first Zoom meeting, uh, we didn't have the shutting down of Thompson Street. Uh, so uh, it was different. Um, now that it, the difference is here, I ask that we um, add, uh, we're at one add 10 high tops uh, with, uh, with two seats with, with each high top. So they're basically high tops for two people uh, right on the Thompson Street uh, parking area. And that's only uh, for the time period that uh, Thompson Street is uh, to be shut down. I'm not asking for any times where there's traffic coming down Thompson Street, just Thursdays, Friday nights, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday day and night, Sunday day and night. That's all I'm asking uh, when we remove the, uh, we'll remove the high tops and chairs uh, on the nights that the street is having through traffic. Um, Obviously, the reason why I didn't ask for this before is because uh, the closing of Thompson Street didn't come to fruition. Um, it has now, and uh, I'd like to utilize that space. But in order for me to use that space, I'm going to have to uh, also ask your permission to take that fourth parking space in front of 3841 uh, Thompson Street, which is a building next to the tavern that I do own as well. And um, I'm hoping to um, take that spot um, uh, for this to work. Thanks, Jim. So um, I, I think you're right. When we were first starting these discussions, um, you were a little ahead of the game um, relative to the other restaurants. And so um, we knew that we were going to have to be kind of making um, some adjustments along the way to make things um, work. Um, I, I did. Um, go down to um, the Black Horse earlier today just to take a look because I, I think there's a lot of confusion where these tables were and um, what um, it looked like on the map and what it was in practice. So, um, and, and I talked to Jen Murphy about it as well, um, just to make sure that, um, you know, there, there wasn't an increased risk with adding tables. I think um, the, um, the, the benefit of the street closure um, allows um, that that area that is sectioned off now um, to go a little bit further, a foot or two into the street um, and to keep these tables um, certainly um, uh, at least six feet. Um, I measured between all the tables and it seems um, that he's able to do that. There was a concern initially when it was just the tabletop there without chairs um, that the um, governor's order doesn't um, provide for a, a bar like setting um, where there's um, kind of standing patrons, but um, uh, there are, you know, seats and there are tables and I think Jim's request for 
the additional um, two tops when where um, the high tops where the um, when there's the, the full street closure, um, it, it probably makes sense if it um, makes sense for the board. Um, I, I also talked to Jen about the um, concern um, with extending another parking space and and that didn't seem to be a problem either. Um, Jim owns that building as well. And so it's um, uh, not going to interfere with any of his tenants there. Um, so um, I think those are the, the two requests. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a few questions, but um, just wanted to give some background there because, um, you know, we, we've had a few um, kind of issues as we've been going along with um, the different restaurants and their understanding of um, what we were looking for and vice versa. So um, I, I think it's just going to be an ongoing um, conversations, but it, but it seems to be, um, you know, since we had voted this, I think last Thursday, um, uh, seems to be a very good response, seems very positive. Um, just want to make sure it's um, safe and there's the appropriate access um, there too. So I don't know if anybody else has questions or wants to weigh in. I just wanted to say something very quickly. First of all, Mr. Kavina, thank you so much for your investment in, uh, in the town. And um, in a number of respects, but including this one, and also for your vision with respect to outdoor dining. Um, I'm supportive of this as well, because I think that um, the diversity of offerings with the high tops, in addition to what is already part of the outdoor dining there, um, will provide options for patrons. And also perhaps, I may be wrong, but it seems like high tops, perhaps they'll also encourage the kind of um, speed or sort of fluidity of the dining experience so that, you know, you can have more diners enjoy the experience with um, sort of those who are at the high tops kind of like finishing up, you know, their, their food or, or whatever they're there for. And then um, giving other patrons a, a turn. And especially as our chair said, and as you indicated, because you own the abutting structure, um, it seems like, and if Thompson Street would already be closed during these time periods that taking the additional parking spot would not um, detract from the purpose of it at that time. So um, I, again, appreciate your creativity. We want the businesses in Winchester to always do well, but particularly right now. So uh, thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, this is um, Amy Shapiro. I um, thank you so much for being here and for what you're doing. I was down, I got takeout on um, Saturday night and it was amazing to see the, um, the line you know, for people patiently waiting for tables. And, um, you know, it was just, it, the downtown really felt like it was alive for the first time in quite a long time. So thank you for that. Um, I am totally in support of this. I think that I just want, and I hate to do this, but I feel like we need to talk about the Thompson Street closure um, on a larger level before we make a decision on this specific um, request. And because um, I know that there's been some talk about, you know, we, we, we went into the vote on closing Thompson Street, knowing that we were going to continue to assess it and see what type of feedback we got. So um, I would just, I think for, for me, I feel like we need to make, have that discussion. But, um, you know, for the times that Thompson Street is closed, I am 100% behind this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I would say my, my wife and I were at the black horse and we sat at one of the high tables that are on, um, on the parking spots on Thompson street yesterday and, uh, Thompson street yesterday as the Sunday was closed. Um, by the way, all of the tables were full. So, um, I think that having more tables will, would help, uh, because also we walked by, uh, first house pub and all their tables were full too. So, Clearly, residents want to come out. Um, Thompson Street being closed, it was great to see. Uh, kids were riding their skateboards. People were riding bicycles, were walking, uh, and they were able to keep uh, social distancing without being crammed into uh, the narrow sidewalks there. Um, you know, I, I, I wish, you know, I know a lot of retailers are closed on Sunday, so um, the, the retailers weren't able to uh, take as much advantage of so many people in the town center. Um, so I think that when we see the effect that closing down Thompson Street has, uh, maybe if we can also close it during the day on Saturday so that the retailers can benefit uh, from all of the people that come to the town center when uh, they know that, um, that the streets are friendly uh, for, for people to walk around and that we've opened 72 new parking spots within half a block of there. Um, 
So, uh, but I agree with Amy, we should make it as more of a holistic discussion on what we want to do with the town center, but I'm, I'm totally in favor of extending the premises uh, while Thompson Street is closed. Thank you. Can I just ask a, a little for a little clarity about, you wanna add um, how many tables and then how many total would you then have? So right now I have uh, nine picnic tables. Okay. Uh, I would add two more picnic tables in front of the 3941 Thompson Street property on the sidewalk. I would have that, hopefully uh, have that parking space out front so that we can, that, that would be the location where the um, handicap ramp goes. Um, and right outside on that parking space, I'd like to have uh, three more high tops, taking a high top away from the other section. So having a total of 10 high tops that seat two people, which will alleviate all the, you know, the, the families to have the picnic tables. And because with this, with this, the way it's set up now is, you know, we were ending up with two people at a picnic table which is tough, you know, and, mm -hmm. and with families waiting. So with all these uh, two seat high tops uh, available, um, couples come down and take advantage of it. And it's pretty, pretty much a first choice over the picnic table. Mm -hmm. Our picnic table, uh, we can what seat eight people, but we're only allowed to sit six. So we have uh, six people um, at once and then um, all the way down to two people, so. That gives you some flexibility. Yeah, it really does. And, it, and it's great for the customers. It's great for the, you know, and then this other thing that with the social distancing, I mean, uh, the more people we can see, the more people we can keep social distance, socially distance, you know. Yes. You know what I'm so, um, okay. I, I, thank you. Thank you. So I, I think that we can um, have uh, two, um, separate motions, um, unless, I don't know if there are any other um, questions, you know, we, we still um, are gonna be evaluating the Thompson Street closure on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, we only have a really small sample to um, evaluate at this point, um, but um, for, the, for the time being, I think that um, the additional, um, are there any concerns from other board members of the additional table in front of 34, 31, what's the address there, Jim? 39 and 41 Thompson. 39 and 41 Thompson Street. Um, I, it, it seems, you know, I looked at the space where it was. And so, um, you know, I'll take a, a motion um, to allow um, Black Horse Tavern to um, have an, an additional uh, tape, sidewalk table um, on um, uh, 39 to 41 Thompson Street. So moved. Um, I'll, take, I'll take a roll call vote. Um, Jackie? Yes. Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes, for me, the motion carries um, unanimously. So Jim, that means um, extending um, that kind of safety zone um, that you have there um, out a little further with that, um, that access ramp that you have too, um, just to make that clear. Um, and we'll work with you also um, on um, some drawings that um, are a little bit more, um, you know, accurate for what what we're looking for. Because I think that there is a lot of confusion um, about what's going where, and um, you know, we want to facilitate that that process. So we'll we'll work with Town Hall to um, get get some more formal drawings done. Um, the the second piece, um, uh, you know, of of his request are the additional tables. Um, during the Thompson Street closure, um, is I'll, I mean, I'll take a motion to that effect. If there aren't any other questions or concerns, so I guess I would move that um, Black Horse Tavern is uh, uh, allowed to extend its premises to add three high top tables with chairs on on Thompson Street when Thompson Street is closed. Yeah, I, I think I have to go back to that and do the whole thing because I okay. never permission to do all of the high tops 
I thought that I automatically had it once the streets shut down. Um, so I guess it's for the whole, for all of them, all 10. Uh, oh, right. so. okay. And right, I thought you had more than three hot top, high tops that you were. Okay, uh, that's what I was confused about too. The three is the additional, but the total is 10. So, okay. And they're all on Thompson Street? They're all on Thompson Street and only during the closing hours of Thompson Street. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All so, right, to so have 10, to 10 high top tables. Second. Yes. Um, all in favor, I'll take a, a roll call vote. Um, Jackie? Yes. Amy? Uh, yes, and we'll just, you know, just make a commitment to Mr. Covina that we'll let him know, you know, what, as things move on, what the, what those times are for the closure of Thompson Street. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, Susan? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes, for me, the motion carries unanimously. So, uh, Mr. Covino, we'll, we'll work with you and try to um, get some, um, some clarity on the drawings of what goes where and when. And um, we will keep you posted if there's any uh, changes um, to the closure of Thompson Street. So we'll be. Okay. Um, my, 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 my question and concern is uh, this takes place right now on Thursday night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Yes. Okay. Thank can, you. Can I, can I just ask a super quick question since you're here? I'm just kind of curious. What is the what happens if it rains? Like I'm just I'm not asking about this specific motion, but just I, in general. I lose, I lose my shirt. Yeah. It rained, it rained. It rained the other night, and we and I think I had two or two tables, and then mm -hmm. that was all done. And then I have everybody in there that I'm paying uh, the staff, and and it's it's a loss. It's a huge loss. So rain is going to hurt all of us that are doing outdoor seating, unless you have a tent, of course. And, some of the places downtown have tents. I don't. I don't have that. You know. Um, yeah, I was just kind of curious because, especially if this is ongoing, you know. I mean, obviously, you right. this is for your business, but um, you know, some sort of like awning, you know, yeah. that can come down or something like that. Maybe uh, that. I, I have the umbrellas for the for the tables, and I, I do have awnings, but I think the umbrellas would are in the way of the awnings. So, mm -hmm. you know, unless I got spent more money and cut uh, those tents and but then you'd have to take them down and nothing's going to be permanent over there unless of course it's shut down you know thursday through sunday without anybody coming down you know but that's doesn't seem to way, the way that it's going to be going or has been going so i'm just happy to be able to do this on the days that uh, thompson street is shut mm -hmm. down i think it's fair and i think it's reasonable Thank you again for your commitment to the town. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Jim. We'll see you okay. soon. Um, are there any other um, matters from the audience? Uh, seeing none, we'll um, move um, to the first um, order of business. I see that we have some staff here. So Lisa, are we okay with um, holding off on your report for a little sure. bit? Yep. To, um, what do you think um, is best to jump into? Um, so the Verizon franchise agreement um, is postponed. I, I can't remember if you remember, Patty, exactly um, what date. I think you might be ready for the next meeting. Um, we have the MBTA response letter and uh, Bessel's on the line to um, help us work through some recommendations on the remainder of the, uh, the chamber um, suggestions. So, um, and the Waterfield lot. I mean, they're all kind of interrelated right now. I think um, the the finishing up the chamber letter might be the quickest thing to do right now. And I can pull that up on the screen in terms of their recommendations. Okay, uh, just to go through some of their recommendations for discussion. Um, so they wanted to eliminate all the commuter parking in the Abrajona lot when the station closes for construction. Um, so this is something where um, 
my suggestion is to wait on this uh, suggestion until we have a better understanding of what DCR is uh, doing with the Sandy Beach lot and whether we can use that for commuters. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, right now we did make the change to use Aberjona for a lot of the downtown retailers. Um, in terms of any longer term discussion, I think we uh, we need to wait on this one. Um, so the other yeah, one, also, I Lisa, I was just going to say, I, I also feel like towards the back of that lot, um, there's probably an opportunity for some additional commuter spots that could, they can walk the path to Wedgemere too. I think you're right about that. I wouldn't. Um, this is Beth. I can um, respond to that, Amy, if you'd like. Um, sure. There may be some space for a few, but we've looked at it over the years, and unfortunately, there's an Emdebury shoreline that's um kind of in the slope there so there's not much ability for us to push things back any further than what you see as paved space now um so we might be able to gain you know a couple of spaces here or there but not a huge opportunity unfortunately on the way to like in the gin parking lot yeah so between okay. uh -huh. the abrazona um as you go down towards skin um yep. you can see like on the slope um on the train station side and then also on the river side there's you can see manhole structures that stick out of the ground okay. got it um yep okay uh the next item is um in the middle here this uh they're looking for Laraway road lot to be one hour free parking until it's closed for construction um so unfortunately, this is a bit of an issue for um, programming for our machines. So we were going to do a big conversion um, prior to COVID-19 and we held off on that project for now. Um, so right now, this uh, we don't think that our current machines can make this happen, but if we can figure it away, then uh, we'll come back to you and uh, make that suggestion. Any questions on that? Okay, so towards the north, um, these 13 two hour permit spaces, um, the chamber would like to convert that to one hour. So from two hours to one hour. Um, so um, we do have a number of businesses um, there such as, as the doctor's offices. So I'm actually not um, normally I would sort of door knock, but uh, we can't do that now. So I don't have a sense of how long um, their customers need to park there. So I'm, I'm a little reluctant to make that change right now to go from a two hour to one hour spot, um, just because I think that there's, um, you know, quite a few businesses there that might need that two hour slot. Um, so until I hear more um, about whether the folks on Shore Road would be okay with that. Um, I'd like to just stick to the the two hours for now. So not making any changes at the moment. That seems wise. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have this uh, uh, three hour, um, actually I'm, I'm not, so I'm not as familiar with this particular area back here by Wedge Pond. Um, yeah, I think most of that area is unregulated currently. So let me just see exactly what their recommendation is, or what is what is that? What is there now, um, Beth? Yeah, it's unregulated. So um, oh, unregulated. It's gray. Yeah. Okay. I think they were talking about um, employee parking in there. I feel like that's what maybe that maybe I'm remembering that incorrectly, but I think that's where the the slash permit. Okay. So either three yeah. hours or, or uh, permit parking. So, uh, I don't know if, if that requires signage or if that's just because it's unregulated. Basically, us letting <laughs> the permit holders know that they can park there. Um, yeah. So I mean, I would be concerned because it it is a you know, Wedge Pond Road in particular is all residential, um, aside from 
um, I think the synagogue goes up there, um, Vine Street, there's two large, um, you know, apartment complexes in there, there's other condos in that area, so, um, you know, I think it's probably worth a wider conversation, because there are probably a lot of people in that neighborhood who don't park there overnight, but would park there during the day, uh, park vehicles during the day. Um, so it's probably worth a larger conversation with that neighborhood if they're, um, you know, interested in having those spaces converted to permit spaces because that would basically, um, you know, take away any on-street parking in front of their homes. I was kind of thinking the same thing. There are a lot of um, residents there. Yeah, I yeah, think we, have, we just have to, sorry Beth, I think we just have to keep in mind that the, the um, employee parking, I know that that's already a challenge. So I don't know what the answer is, um, but I think that that's something we need to just keep in mind. Maybe that's not the right area for it, but something to consider. Right, so so currently our the permit that we sell um, is good for either town center employees or commuters. Um, that we sell permits to maybe 250 commuters every year and of the rest of the thousand permits that we sell for your town center employees. So there's a lot of town center employees that can currently park anywhere that a permit is valid. Um, and that includes the Jinx lot, the Aboriginal lot, the Waterfield lot, um, any of the on-street parking in the Dick Street neighborhood, as well as the parking all the way up North Main Street um, by like Elliott Park and Stop and Shop. I think those spaces are probably fairly underutilized. Um, so there's usually, when you go by, there's usually parking available um, in that area. Um, and again, depending what happens with the train station, uh, the, you know, the Jenks lot probably would be more available to town center employees because I don't think a lot of commuters would park at Jenks and walk down to Wedgemere, whereas people might park at Abjona and walk down to Wedgemere. Um, mm. That makes sense. So there's nothing stopping a permit parker, a uh, permit holder, or anybody from parking in this area right now. I think that, um, so I would just recommend that we um, we not add any additional regulations here because it is residential. Okay, so uh, I mean, our recommendation summary is that we don't recommend that you make any additional changes at this point in time. And if there's no other questions, then I'd love to move on to the MBTA cost sharing letter. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Thanks, can folks see the screen right now as well? Yes. Okay, so uh, this was, this is a letter dated June 3rd. Um, they sent this over the Friday before town meeting started, uh, or that's when we received it via email. So in terms of uh, the, um, I guess the, the history of this, uh, they've been referencing um, cost sharing items for a while. Um, the first cost sharing letter they, they sent to us um, a while ago were had some, you know, pretty big numbers on it. It was, you know, one and a half million for this and a couple hundred thousand for that. So um, most of those items and issues have, have been worked out. Either um, they've been actually eliminated from the project because of redesign or um, were irrelevant or worked out in some other way or were included in the project. So we've been waiting for this letter, which I would say is a bunch of um, miscellaneous things. Um, we were also trying to get an understanding of what other kinds of um, cost sharing agreements they have in place. Uh, they're saying that they do have some where, where um, towns do put in some sort of involvement. Um, some of these are sort of in the, so I would say categorically nitpicky. Um, Others might be a little bit more reasonable. So I just wanted to go through this and um, get your thoughts and opinions. So uh, the first one here is uh, painting the pedestrian tunnel. Um, they're saying this is gonna cost 17,500. Um, Beth, do you have a sense of, 
of what they, if, if they weren't painting it, what, what their sense was, um, what they were going to leave it as? Um, the condition it's in today, I think. Which is not spectacular. <laughs> is, is there lighting in there? Um, so I think right now there's like string lights hung up that the DPW has added because yeah. the lighting has failed over the years. Um, but the, there is in their plans, uh, they are proposing to redo the lighting. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> if, if it were a lighter color, I think, you know, if we're painted a light blue or something, I think, it, well, it would be subject to getting graffitied, but it would seem less like a passing through a dungeon than it does now. Yeah. We say, is it worth, um, I'm just thinking of the first one and I'm sure that there's gonna be others, but is it worth looking at um, like what the cost would be if the DPW were to do it or if there's mm -hmm. another provider that we could get to do, get give us estimates on some of the things that we wanna do um, and just leave it out of the contract with the MBTA? Yeah, Th this would so be- I think the issue is that it's not town property. Um, you know, it's, we'd have to have an agreement with them for the town to be able to go in and do that work ourselves. Got it. Not that it couldn't be done and certainly could be discussed as part of the easements we're talking about, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, th this is something that can be done after the fact later on. So it's not something that's gonna hold up the project or we've missed our chance to do that. So I would say, right. uh, let's, let's punt on this one. Okay. Um, okay, this one, I don't know if you got, um, Beth, Beth, you might have a better sense of how the design review committee feels, but you know, saying that there's a cost to discuss the color palette. Um, yes, I think they're saying if, um, so it's actually not, it, it's the, the working group that, um, not that the technical design review committee that the, um, is a separate town committee, but um, so I think the idea is that there would be probably a couple members of that group that would work with them to um, figure out what the colors are that would be preferred. And I think they're saying that if we choose a non-standard color, then that would be um, more money. I, I don't have personally enough knowledge of this to say whether that's reasonable or not, but um, David Anderson, we did, I did send this letter to David Anderson. He had some responses, which I don't have um, up right now because unfortunately my screen is frozen, but um, you know, it's something that we could probably have a wider conversation with um, David and some others about the reasonableness of this item. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a sense of whether standard colors in you know MBTA world is is only like a few colors and then everything else is non-standard so um we can discuss this further um all right pigeon protection so um the MBTA doesn't carry this in its, its specs we've been talking about this um throughout the project because it is an issue um they're saying that this is the netting is is nineteen thousand dollars Since it's netting, is this something we could also do later? I don't even so know. I, don't, I think this is something that has to be done as part of the initial construction. Um, okay. We did raise this as an issue um, because there's been, a, there's been problems over the years with pigeons nesting under the Waterfield Road Bridge and under the rotary, which makes it not particularly um, inviting for pedestrians and also pigeon waste is um, in large quantities is actually a hazardous waste. So it's expensive mm -hmm. for removal and is an issue. So the it's a issue, hell of a spot a, if you're a pigeon though. I mean, that's a good spot. It's right? a great spot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just wanna provide the other side of the discussion. That's a, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not un, unsympathetic with pigeons. <laughs> um, but the, the bigger issue is here as part of this project, the platforms being raised. So it's the 
you know, we're going from the platform at the track to a high level platform, which will be four feet, um, four feet above what it is today. Um, so there's additional space there, right? So we've, you know, kind of talked over the years with them on many occasions about what the options are. Um, and I think they've said that they would kind of figure it out during construction, that type of thing. Um, mm. And again, unfortunately, my screen is, is, um, it's frozen, so I can't see exactly what they wrote up there, but um, you know, I do think it's something that's worth a conversation. Yeah, it says the town requested welded angle pieces on the web of steel to compact pigeons. However, this is not advisable as it limits bridge inspections that must be carried out. So they believe that the netting is a suitable alt alternative at a cost of 19,000. So the netting is the cost of 19,000? Yeah. Is it like steel netting or is it, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I just, I was, yeah. I mean, how That's often are we going to have to replace that? I guess is the question. It's, yeah, I was curious too, because there is steel netting yeah. at some of the locations and it definitely seems to have mixed results. Cool so would this be nylon maybe? So, I mean, I don't think it's ever, it's not that the, the tab wouldn't replace it because it's not our property. Um, although getting the tea to replace it is, challenging um but it's just you know the ease of long-term maintenance of that type of um setup is a concern obviously okay so this is something that is a reasonable conversation for us to continue yes um so we'll do some more investigating maybe there are some pigeon experts out there that can help us understand the, the type of netting, its replacement, um, its effectiveness, and so on. All right, granite cladding at the abutments. Um, the MBTA has identified a cost and scope of this work. Uh, this is the drawings on A401, 402 to show where the granite cladding is proposed. Uh, so they would normally use a precast concrete finish rather than specifying granite. Uh, so it's saying that if they include it, it's going to be 70,000. Yeah, so this was confusing because they're, um, the most recent drawings that they've provided us shows granite cladding both on the new pier that they're constructing, as well as um, where they're disturbing the stone at the Waterfield Road Bridge, so on the Waterfield parking lot side. So the plan showed the granite cladding, and then when we questioned them about about it because they had mentioned before that they thought the town should contribute to that. Um, th then this is what we got back about the um, precast versus granite. So it's really just an aesthetic um, point and probably worth having a conversation with about with the working group or representatives of the working group about what is reasonable. Um, the other peers that are under the rotary are already clad in granite. So the idea is that um, granite cladding would help the new pier to blend in with what already exists there, um, but probably worth further conversation. I think that makes sense. Can, can I just ask a quick question, and I apologize if I should have known this or if it's already in this document, but are they able to save any of the stone? That yeah, so they, um, in, in large portions on the Lairway Road side, they are saving a lot of the stone. There'll be some granite precast there, but on the Waterfield lot and the Aboriginal lot, um, we made a concession to basically say that um, for the most part, they would be using a precast con concrete structure to reduce the cost, overall cost there. But I mean, when they do that, are they, Dis, they're dismantling what exists now. They're not able to save that stone, or is it a question so of on, save it? They, they yeah, on the Lairway roadside, they're preserving as much of it as they can in place, um, and then using um, in areas where they have to fill in, they'll be using uh, you know stone that they've taken off of other areas and and putting it there. Um, so in other words, you're saying like the huge wall that you typically see should look similar other than the design change, is that fair to assume? Beth? Oh, 
Is Beth still there? I think we lost her. I don't see her. Um... She said her screen froze, so maybe things got worse. Um, okay, do we... When she comes back, I'd like to ask that question. Again. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you want to just move on to the Waterfield lot? And we'll get back to this. Sure. I mean, um, yep, yeah, I mean, Beth is part of that discussion too, but we can, we can yeah. jump back, we can jump back to it. Um, okay. Um, okay, so the Waterfield RFP, um, I think Brian was going to join us as well. He's got another meeting. Um, we have uh, Francis, who's on. Hi, Francis. <laughs> oh, there you go, Brian. Um, do one of you have um, the PowerPoint from earlier that we can share and go over a few points? Sure, I can. I have it. Can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. I'm trying the, the phone audio oh. today. So we'll no, um, and actually Beth no. is on it too. Sorry. Sorry, I'm back in. I'm not sure what just happened. My remote remote connection just uh, hung up on me. <laughs> oh, no. Apologize. Um, if you don't mind, um, sorry, Francis, to key you up like that and then take it away. But um if we don't if you don't mind just going back and finishing this letter. Uh, so we just started talking about the uh, the stone and the average on elevation. And Jackie, you had a question. Yeah, I don't know, Beth, if you already heard my question before um, the Wi-Fi went out, but I, I just wanted to clarify when you say layer away road. So what we see currently, which is a large wall of beautiful stone, will that appearance go along the entire length of layer away? Um, it will look different than it does today, yes. So they are preserving, um, where there is no ramp currently, they are preserving all of that stone. They're adding a stairway between where the current ramp is and Lairway Road, and that stairway will have a precast concrete cladding on it. And then they're, where the existing ramp is, they're taking that ramp down and building a new one that will be longer than what you see there today, I believe. Um, and that will have, um, some granite cladding reuse of what's there, but there will also be some precast concrete. And I can send you a, separately, I can send you a plan that shows um, that detail, that elevation, if you'd like, if that's helpful. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I think it'd be helpful for the board to see as well, just so we'll know, especially if we get questions. And also, I'm assuming the design review folks will be looking at that, but just what the visual will actually, how it will appear in that elevation. Um, and then also- Yeah. So. The, the working group has really tried to prioritize the view shed on the Lairway Road side because that's what you see from the common and kind of made some compromises on the Abergona and Waterfield lot side because those are a little bit more, um, you know, sheltered from most people's view. Right. Okay. And then my last question is, to the extent that there's some locations where they won't be um, putting in this, the original stone um, facade, um, any any stone that gets sort of like removed, it sounds like you were saying that, that sometimes they may be able to use that stone for different locations as well. So I'm assuming that um, yeah, so, that was a request made. Thank you. Yeah. So the, to the extent that they can reuse it in areas they are, um, but but in other areas for cost saving purposes, they're just putting in the the granite, the precast granite panels. Okay, hopefully they'll be able to eventually use everything at some point and so we won't lose it. But um, anyway, just wanted to ask. Thank you. Sure. So had we decided uh, about the granite on the abutment so that it looks, if that's the right word, so that that newer one would be consistent with the other ones? Is that something we wanna pursue? 
Yeah, so um, I think it's probably worth a conversation with the working group or representatives yeah. from the working group to get their opinion on what um, makes sense there. Okay. I think that the same applies to a, a few of these other items right. here. So the uh, preserving the stone at the Abrajona elevation. Um, they're pretty much saying the, no, right? Yeah, they're saying no to this. So um, I think the... Um, you know, obviously we'll we'll continue to develop a response and whether this is something we, we want to push back on. Mm -hmm. The Abrajona ramp roof um, cantilever, uh, Beth, I'm not as familiar with this one, but it's the, uh, the town wanted a single post double cantilever roof design for the outbound platform. Um, they're saying- Yeah, I think maybe we asked for that like a year ago. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how it made it into this letter as a priority, but I, I don't think that's, um, something at this point we want to pursue. Okay. It sounds expensive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so seven is the granite edging of planting beds. So um, 8,500 bucks. Yeah, so again, I, I um, Julie Riemann Schneider is on the working group, and so I'd probably um, recommend we kind of talk to her about that, um, as she's a landscape architect, and um, she's been a great, had great, great ideas in terms of um, making comments on the landscaping plan. Okay, the irrigation system. Um, so $50,000 for... Um, an irrigation system for design and materials. I don't, is this, um, I actually, I don't know the, the exact area. Beth, do you know exactly where they're planning? They're looking at the irrigation system? Um, so I think we are looking at the areas that the, there's landscaping in the Aboriginal a lot and then landscaping along the way road. Um, I'd have to, go back to our memo to figure out exactly uh, if we specified which areas could or should be irrigated, but okay. probably worth a conversation the, again with the working group the and, and DPW. So, so we'll at the rotary, they're just putting back loam and seed that, at our request. Um, I, I'm sure there's, I would guess there's probably irrigation already out there, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and then I think we said that we would just our, the town itself would re landscape that area where it's disturbed. Okay, and then number nine is the uh, the salvage stone at the Layerway Road ramp, um, $80,000. So right um, now, looking at precast. This, is this yeah, what you for, Beth, where this the, is, one part of it is going to be precast and the rest is going to be stone but here they're offering to have it all be stone right yeah so the um the kind of the they're preserving the the back at the ramp they're preserving kind of the back of the ramp which will be the existing stone wall and then where the ramp kind of comes out and meets the meets the existing sidewalk that lower piece will be the precast um concrete um structure mm -hmm. Or poured concrete, not precast. I mean, we're going to be looking at this for, for I might not be around, but for thirty or fifty years. I'm thinking we might really want this to be all the um, salvaged stone on Laraway Road. So I think it, on this one, I think it would be helpful to for them to mark up a plan to make sure we're both visualizing the same area that they're talking about um, for this. But I, I would, you know, I agree if this is an area we want to spend money um, to make it improve the aesthetics, it might be a good place to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of how they came up with these numbers? They seem kind of arbitrary. <laughs> um, I, I have no idea now. Uh, they, yeah. you know, I believe I mean, they're, they're in the process of um, redoing their cost estimate as part of their 100% plan. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible that they worked with an estimator to do that, but I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, solar panels. 
Um, so this is a little bit different. I think before, um, before they had mentioned that they would, um, they said we could sort of like design. Well, actually the first response was um, we can't accommodate it. And the second response was, um, well, we can, if you give us money, then we can accommodate um, future panels at your cost. And now this one is a number um, for the actual project itself. Yeah, so, I'm, I, was, I was a little confused as well, because I thought the way we had left it was they were going to have the electrical, like the conduits or whatever, the infrastructure in there so that we could do the panels if we wanted. And now, but at our cost, and then there was no number for that. And now they're saying that they would do the whole thing. So I think the issue is the cost. So the, the canopies are built just you know, as lightweight canopy structures. And mm -hmm. if we are going to add solar panels onto those canopies in the future, then there's a, there's an additional cost associated with the, you know, manufacturing and that structural um, engineering of that structure itself. Okay. Um, that has to be more, more sturdy to be able to hold solar panels. Okay. Um, so I believe that's what the $100,000 is, is the, the kind of the cost to upgrade that canopy to be able to carry the weight of a solar panel. Well, this mm. says that it yeah. also covers the cost of the panels, right? So I'm wondering how much it would cost to just make the canopy um, able to hold panels in the future. So it also says a budgetary cost, like, um, I don't know if that also means that we cover anything above and, and beyond. Um, and I also really haven't worked out with them exactly what, um, if those panels were there, exactly what the agreement would be. Um, so I think this is worth a conversation worth pursuing. So um, any questions that you guys have um, sent our way, we'll, we'll get more information. Um, I might even rope the energy committee into this to take a look at it more. Yeah, I, I would, I, yes, it's worth per pursuing and talking about. And if we can sort of understand what it would cost to have the canopies sort of solar ready. I think that would be helpful. I think the the other issue with the solar panels that um, um, came up, um, you know, a few years ago when we first started discussing this was um, just the the risk of having them connected to the um, the the train station where they're um, there would need to be a lot of maintenance and it was, you know, very risky with a lot of projectiles and things like that. So, um, you know, if we're kind of on the hook for long-term maintenance, you know, of these and, you know, they're getting, you know, broken or something, I, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was the issue why it kind of fell off at one point and, until, you know, recently it came back on. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I think solar panels might, you know, are you know, a great idea most places, but I think this was one that the committee at one point had been steered away from, but that was also a completely different um, representative group of the MBTA team too. It was a different group, but. Yeah, it's, an, it's an interesting question. I wonder if it's like a vibration issue or something, but you do see a lot of solar panels increasingly along highways now. And yep. You know, presumably there's projectiles there also, but I, I'm kind of wondering if it was, you know, something related to what you're saying, um, Mr. Chairman, that maybe related to vibration too. But obviously, we'd all be in favor of pan uh, solar panels if they can be ins installed there. Yeah, just thought I'd mention it. Okay, last but not least, um, the artwork. Um, so I, this is something that I've mentioned in the past. So I just need to reach back out to the Cultural Council, Mary, the Griffin Museum, um, and anybody else who um, has been visualizing whatever artwork could be part of the project to, to you know, start the conversations now. Um, so the timeline they mentioned here, so they're, um, 
they're saying they hope they hope to advertise the job in next month um, and then issue a notice to proceed in August. So um, let's see, the MDTA would have to have a confirmation of items included in this letter to be approved by the November 2020 town meeting. I'm just, I'm a little confused by that I'm statement because I think they would, <laughs> they would need to know what we want to be able to put it into the bid documents unless they do it as a addendum um, or change order later, but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So yeah, I'm a little confused by that. I, I'm, I'm wondering if that used to say Springtown meeting and then when I told them it wasn't possible, they just changed it. Um, without understanding how this makes sense. Uh, but I mean, we uh, will circle back with the working group sooner than later. Um, so we're hoping to have a response sooner than later. Um, so maybe we can have um, a November spelled wrong. So I'm just, that's just, so it does look like they just, they might've just stuck that in at the last minute. Um, so maybe we'll have a, a better sense of where we need to go by the next like, board meeting in two weeks. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your feedback. Thanks, Lisa. Um, before we um, jump in, I, I see um, Sheila is here, um, and we have uh, Jason Lee is here as well for an appointment. Um, you know, if, if I don't know if we need to take care of a couple of those things before we um, um, move on for a little bit longer discussion. I think the the Waterfield lot is, is a little bit. Yep more involved. Okay. Um, so I, and, um, we'll take Jason first, um, uh, out of order. Um, I think, uh, Jason is here as a, uh, applicant for the traffic and transportation advisory committee. Um, we actually kind of got a little bit, um, mixed up with the, um, the interviews. So we didn't reach out to everyone that, um, needs to kind of come before us that we want to meet for the first time. Um, but I'm glad that Jason is here. I'm looking for an appointment um, the term to expire March 31st, 2023. So um, welcome, Jason. I hope you're, you're still there. I know we've been kind of keeping you waiting for um, a long time, um, but uh, I think that you've submitted some materials to the board and um, would be um, happy to hear from you. Um, but if you're not standing by, we can also um, come back to you at a later point. Looks like he's muted. Yeah, and, and Sheila, um, we have to um, take a vote on um, some bonds as well. Um, is, is that um, maybe we can we can jump to that quickly? And you're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Sheila. Okay. Good evening. Uh, yes, we have um, a few borrowings that we have to approve tonight. One, first of all, in the um, preparation for these two borrowings, um, Moody's did confirm the AAA rating for the town um, and gave us a very good report. Um, so that also helped us in getting the rate we did. We get a very good rate on both borrowings. Um, one is a one year temporary borrowing uh, bond anticipation note mostly for the high school construction, the last piece of it, the construction, because the MSBA has not yet signed off on the project, we can't permanently borrow it yet. So it's just over $4 million for the high school and $500,000 for the reservoir spillway and drainage upgrades. So it's about $4.6 million on a short-term one, one year BN. Um, the interest rate we received, uh, the winning bidder was Century Bank with a premium of $8,816, which gave us a net interest cost of 0.70%. So less than 1%, it was a great rate. The more permanent borrowing um, had two facets to it. We had new projects, four projects, three bridges, Lake Street Bridge, Waterfield Bridge, Swanton Street Bridge, and then the North Reservoir Dam improvements for a total of $5.88 million. And together with that, we refunded five borrowings that we had previously borrowed between 2005, 2010. You know, there are a lot of um, hoops that you have to jump through to be able to refund borrowings. Um, but we were able to refund five 
um, and it saved the town quite a bit. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. But it's a 25 year term. So we combine the five refunding borrowing with the four new projects. And we received eight bids. The winning bid was um, Jenny Montgomery Scott with a premium of just over $2.4 million and a net interest cost of 1.36%. So when doing the refunding, the town will experience the savings over the life of the borrowings of just over $1.3 million. Now, that's spread over 28 different projects in these five borrowings, and some of them, you know, stabilization funds, some are exempt. So, you know, it, over the life of the borrowing, that's the savings, though, that we will experience. So um, the vote, Susan has the vote that has to be read into the record. And it will be the approval of both the permanent borrowing and the short term borrowing. Um, the other issue is, of course, um, because we're remote last borrowing, we had people come in and, and sign off. This borrowing will be a lot more documents to sign off on. And bond council wasn't able to get it to us before the end of the day today. And they have promised to get it to us tomorrow, early in the day. So. Um, I don't know what the best approach is if people are able to, um, perhaps I could email everybody tomorrow when we get the borrowings. I'm expecting that we should have them by noon. So if people were able to come, you know, sometime afternoon between noon and two or three o'clock, it would be great. Um, but I'll email the board and let you know. And if that doesn't work for people, we can always make an arrangement to meet up to um, get them signed. So. Great. Susan should have the vote. Thanks, Sheila. Um, sorry, Susan. So I just oh. have another a quick question because you, you were scaring me. The, the, all you need me to do is this one thing that says votes of the select board. Well, no, you have to, you you have to read the the beginning. I the clerk, and then the next part that's voted. What you don't really have to read is the schedules where it has the years and the amounts per year. Okay. You can just state as as indicated below or something to that to that effect. Um, and the same with the second schedule, the smaller one. Okay. But the ones that all say further voted, you do need to read those, unfortunately. Okay, all right. Sorry, um, it is always Sheila, a long vote. Um, yeah, uh, quick question. Um, if we're getting, um, I mean, obviously we're getting two point uh, something million in premiums and that's mainly because the coupon is at 5%. Um, is there a reason that the coupon is at five percent versus, for example, a two percent coupon and and less uh, premium up front? Well, what happens when the bids come in, and I can get you the bid sheet that will tell you how each person uh, bid on it. Um, sometimes people bid, uh, you know, a different rate without a premium or a smaller premium. So what Hilltop Securities does is they take all of those factored together, the bid plus the premium to come out with the, the, the best, the lowest net cost, the net rate. Oh, so, okay. so the coupon is not set by us, but it's part of the bid? It's part of the bid. And then, and then the coupon is then adjusted by the premium. Yeah, are, are these so, callable? Yes. And that's the other uh, feature that all these, we were able to refund these five borrowings because they are all callable. That's okay. the first provision we have to have. And, and more often than not, all of ours are callable. I mean, there are times when perhaps in certain times when the markets, you know, aren't looking favorably on the callable ones or the very difficult market, you might not do that in order to get a better rate. But, but we've had no problem at all with, with getting great rates and they are callable. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that, that's a great discount rate. I'm just surprised mm -hmm. that they're willing to give us such a high um coupon on a callable bond because you know two years from now we could turn around and we get right. to keep the premium right so yes yes and what typically with the premium what we we use that for issuance costs and then the balance is used to reduce the cost of the borrowing so we actually borrow a little bit less um than we ordinarily would which is an additional savings yep okay thank you sheila you're welcome Okay, so should I just go ahead? Yes. So I, the clerk of the select board of the town of Winchester, Massachusetts, the town certify that at a meeting of the board held on June 15th, 2020, of which all members of the board were duly notified and at which a 
quorum was present, the following votes were unanimously passed, all of which appear upon the official record of the board in my custody. Voted that the sale of the $15,170,000 general obligation municipal purpose loan of 2020 bonds of the town dated June 25th, 2020, the bonds to Janney Montgomery Scott LLC at the price of $17,499,658.66 and accrued interest, if any, is hereby approved and confirmed. The bonds shall be payable on January 1 of the years and in the principal amounts and their interest in the respective rates as follows as set forth in the table below. Further voted that the bonds maturing on January 1st, 2045, a term bond shall be subject to mandatory redemption or, or mature as follows as set forth in the table below. Further voted that in connection with the marketing and sale of the bonds, the preparation and distribu distribution of a notice of sale and a preliminary official statement dated June 3rd, 2020, and a final official statement dated June 10th, 2020, the official statement, each in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer, be and hereby are ratified, confirmed, and approved, and adopted. Further voted that the bonds shall be subject to redemption at the option of the town upon such terms and conditions as are set forth in the official statement. Further voted to authorize the execution and delivery of a refunding escrow agreement, the agreement to be dated June 25th, 2020 between the town and US Bank National Association as refunding escrow agent relating to the refunding of the refunded bonds, each is defined in, this, in the agreement. Further voted to authorize the deposit of $26,935.52 of unexpended refunded bonds proceeds into the refunding escrow fund as defined in the agreement to pay debt service on the related refunded bonds. Further voted to approve the sale of a $4,640,000 general obligation bond anticipation note of the town dated June 26, 2020 at an interest rate of 0.90% and payable June 25th, 2021, the note to Century Bank and Trust Company at par and accrued interest, if any, plus a premium of $8,816. Further voted that in connection with the marketing sale of the note, the preparation and distribution of a notice of sale and preliminary official statement dated, he, ooh, dated June 3rd, 2020, and a final official statement dated June 10th, 2020, each in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer be and hereby are ratified, confirmed, approved, and adopted. Further voted that the town treasurer and the select board be and hereby are authorized to execute and deliver continuing and significant events disclosure undertakings in compliance with SEC rule 15C2-12 in such forms as may be approved by bond council to the town which undertaking shall be incorporated by reference in the bonds and note as applicable for the benefit of the holders of the bonds and note from time to time. Further voted that we authorize and direct the town treasurer to establish post issuance federal tax compliance procedures in such form as the town treasurer and bond council deem sufficient or if such procedures are currently in place to review and update said procedures in order to monitor and maintain the tax exempt status of the bonds and the note and to comply with the relevant securities laws. Further voted that each member of the select board, the town clerk and the town treasurer be and hereby are authorized to take any and all such actions and execute and deliver such certificates, receipts or other documents as may be determined by them or any of them to be necessary or convenient to carry into effect the provisions of the foregoing votes. I further certify that the votes were taken at a meeting open to the public, that no vote was taken by secret ballot, that a notice stating the place or method of accessing date, time, and agenda for the meeting, which agenda included the adoption of the above note votes, was filed with the town clerk and a copy thereof posted in a manner conspicuously visible to the public at all hours in or on the municipal building at which the office of the town clerk is located or if applicable in accordance with an alternative me method of notice prescribed or approved by the attorney general as set forth in 940 CMR 29, Point oh three two b at least 48 hours, not including Saturday, Sundays, and legal holidays prior to the time of the meeting and remain so posted at the time of the meeting and that no deliberations or decision or in connection with the sale of the bonds and the note were taken in executive session, all in accordance with General Law 30A, sections 18 through 25, as amended and in accordance with the governor's emergency order dated March 12, 2020, authorizing remote meetings during COVID-19, during the COVID-19 related state of emergency if applicable. 
Second. Uh, I'll take a roll call vote. Jackie? Yes. Amy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Mariano? Yes. And yes, for me, the motion carries unanimously five to zero. Uh, thank you, Sheila. We really appreciate it. That's um, some really great work. Well, thank you. And again, I'll send an email to the board members um, once we have the documents from the bond council and we'll make arrangements for um, when you can come in to sign. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Just by, by the way, are you thinking tomorrow or were you saying maybe not? Well, if we have them tomorrow, I'll have them available. But if you can't make it tomorrow, we can make it another arrangement for whatever okay. works for everybody. Okay. You know, we can we have through the, the end of this week to get them signed and back to okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Bye bye now. So uh, we'll jump back to the Waterfield RFP. Yes, uh, Francis and Brian, good to go. Sure, um, I'm happy to present and Brian, you chime in um, as needed. Um, let me pull it up real quick. Oh, I can't share. Brian, can you pull it up? Or can I? Um, can oh, I be no. Special power? no, you guys can share now. Um, I just, okay. I just switched oh, it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Wonderful. Can you see it? Uh, no, because I haven't pressed share. Okay. Uh, everybody good? Yes, okay. So, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for being here at almost 9 p.m. Bless you all for the work you do. Uh, so, we've been in conversation about the Waterfield Law and the redevelopment for a long time. Um, I came into the conversation actually when I worked at MAPC and helped do the housing production plan. Um, and then in my current role at Mass Housing, uh, we thought that we would approach the town again, this time to try to um, actually carry out some of the goals and strategies that were in the plan. And that's sort of how this has all developed. Uh, so just quickly, the project is a partnership between the town and Mass Housing. We've had a lot of support from J.M. Goldson and uh, Jen's also been involved with the with the um, the pounds planning. Uh, so she's very familiar with everything that's happening. Um, and the site is great because it's right on the uh, wonderful MBTA stop that you all just talked about. Um, you know, it's right in the center of town but it also has a lot of constraints um, that I think folks are quite familiar with, but they have been one of the reasons why the site hasn't been developed uh, previously. So, you know, we, we come to this RFQ and RFP process um, knowing that it's, a, it's quite a difficult site for development. Um, we also know that there are significant housing needs in town, right? So more than half of all se seniors who are single and live in Winchester are, are low income. Um, around 3% of homes in Winchester are affordable, and that's counting all units that are in the subsidized housing. Oh, can you hear me well? um, and the median price Go ahead, though, Paul. for... Somebody's talking. And the median price for a home in town is $1.3 million. Uh, so there are, it's definitely difficult for some folks to be able to move into town or to move around town once you're there. Uh, we also know that if you are not in a family, you earn a lot less than if you're in a family or the, just the town median income. Um, so the town goes through the housing production plan 
included increasing the diversity of housing types, the supply of housing in locations that make sense, uh, finding suitable public land for housing, and engaging with partners and housing developers. Um, so those are the main goals that this project would address. Um, and we've been working for a while now. So the housing production plan started in 2017. Uh, mass housing and the town started working in partnership in 2019. And in what is 2020, we've had the RFQ review um, and the public meeting. We received responses from the request for qualifications and we're currently drafting the RFP. Uh, with the hope of launching it very soon, and the next week is the hope, and uh, really having it closed and a developer chosen before town meeting in November so that then the developer can work with the town to develop this for uh, 2021 and into the future. Um, we, you know, 2020 has been a rough year so far, so this timeline may change, but that's the hope right now. Um, so for the RFQ, like we said, it was developed by Jane Goldson, but there was input from various members um, around town, and it was launched in October 30th. Uh, it had a variety of different criteria for evaluation, including developers' experience with downtown development, financial capability, experience in local in the local area, uh, partnerships, design and planning, and environmental sustainability. So basically, it's like the first round of uh, matchmaking where you really want to see that um, who you may be going into business with is actually who they who you want them to be. Um, and actually, the responses that we received were really great. Uh, the, ma the majority of developers are very well known and renowned in, in their fields. They're also primarily affordable housing developers. Um, so most of, not all, but the majority of these developers uh, primarily work in 100% affordable housing projects in the area. Um, and I believe that from all of these, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only ones that didn't make the cut to get the RFP are Mary McKenna? Correct. Correct, great. Um, so now we've moved to the request for proposals. So now we know who it is that we want to send us a proposal and we are drafting what the proposal is. Um, so it's been ongoing, it's been an ongoing process from around February to about now. Uh, COVID definitely interrupted the process a little, and we've had a variety of members that are either actively involved um, or have chimed in to the working group process. Um, Jackie, I know that you're in emails, but I don't know. We've it's, it's, I don't know, um, but we've had, Michael has been there throughout and there's been folks from different boards and commissions involved too. Um, yeah, I've been with the meetings I can go to, they're right in the middle of the work day. So sometimes it's, but most of the one, all the ones I've been able to go to, were, I appreciate being there. Yes, great. Wait, so you say you have other things to do outside of this? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the RFP structure is basically three parts. So the first is background information where uh, they, uh, it talks about what the site is, the phasing, the constraints, zoning, and what the process for selection is. The second is the actual request. Um, so it asks for any information that, that is missing regarding the actual developers. Um, the availability and again the timeline for getting the responses back and what the format is and the actual requirements that we're asking include a statement of understanding so that they they can tell us they understand what it is the town wants concept narrative and drawings we know that this is a really important site it's right in the center of town it's a historic district um, so we really wanted to emphasize the, the importance of design here. 
uh, talking about team description, experience, uh, financing capabilities, how they will go through the land acquisition and zoning process, marketing and management of the development, and what the potential timeline is for the project. Um, so there were many different objectives, but the three main objectives of the RFP is to get more mixed income housing in town, preferably rental housing um, for households earning between 30% to 120% of the area median income. Uh, we say those numbers because that's where the main sources of funding are for affordable housing. And we say that at least 25% of the units must be reserved for households earning 80% of area median income. Um, however, when I go into the evaluation criteria, you'll see that we actually would prefer it to be 100% affordable. And as is required by DHCD, at least 10% of units have to have uh, three bedrooms. For the design, like I said, we, we really want to consider where it is and the design considerations of the town itself. So we want it to be integrated with the neighborhood uh, with consideration of scale and style and have public amenities knowing that it's right in the center of town next to the MBTA stop. Um, and environmental sustainability, uh, you know, thinking about what we can do to lower um, the impact of the project on the earth. Uh, so again, these are the different submission requirements that I went through. And we're also, so for the projects, we, we took a series of photos. So we're asking each developer to do at least uh, these three, use the three photos that are displayed right now to have a render of their proposal so that we can sort of judge them equally based on uh, the different vistas from town. Uh, so for the evaluation criteria, we want them to provide the responses to everything we ask for. Uh, we want them to have at least five years of experience in the development of affordable housing because affordable housing and regular market rate development are two very different ball games. Um, again, it has to have at least 25% of units affordable just to be in the running. Uh, a track record of at least three projects that are similar and demonstrated financial capacity to cover the pre-development budget. And these are the 12 points for the evaluation criteria. And what we've done is we've uh, added weights to them. Um, but in addition to the weights, there's different categories from non-advantageous, which is zero points, to highly advantageous, which is, I think, Brian, it's two points or three points. Um, I'm not sure. But ultimately, we. Hmm? I was saying, I believe it's three. Yes. So if you have three points, you've done the the best, everything we asked for. And if it's if if you did nothing, it's zero. And those points get um, multiplied by the weights. So, for example, the first one is affordability, and we added the highest weight to it. So uh, it's four times. So. If you have 100% affordable housing, you get three points and we multiply that by four to get the number of points from that. Um, so again, the first criteria is that it meets the affordable mixed income housing objectives. Uh, the second is related to design, that it's an, of appropriate scale and style. Um, the third is the site layout, so being cognizant of where it is in relation to the MBTA and other um, center amenities. Uh, the sustainability objectives, whether they're being met. Um, parking, so considerations both for parking of residents as well as for the loss of public parking from the project. Uh, willingness to work with the community and the town to refine the conceptual design. Uh, incorporating elements that enhance the cultural district. Um, and thinking of traffic mitigation and what measures that they will put towards that. Um, key terms of uh, the lease agreement and disposition 
although that will also be a subject that the town attorney will have to speak with a developer with later down the line. Uh, Pre-development timeline, uh, the property management of the project, and uh, mitigation of noise and traffic during the construction phase. So as you can see, the majority outside of affordability that has the highest weight, the majority of points go towards design. Um, since again, that's something that's uh, of high importance in this location. And for the selection process, the plan release date is next Monday, so June 22nd. Uh, there'll be a pre-submission meeting on Zoom late July. And there'll also be a, a space there for folks to ha and ask questions. So the questions will be posted after the pre-submission meeting with answers. Uh, the RFP is intended to close August 31st, and that will give the town then time throughout September um, through November to interview and select the developer um, with the purpose of being ready for the town meeting in November for the land disposition approval. And that is it for the presentation. And then I have some questions for you all, but first, are there any questions? Thanks, Francis. That was great. Um, this has been a really long um, process for the committee and been um, very engaged as well. So um, been a lot of um, really great conversations. And um, um, so I think that we're at a good place for a really tough location to develop, um, especially in the, in the way that we um, are looking to do it. So. Um, uh, any any questions um, for Francis, for Brian, Lisa? I see uh, John Serbier is um, here as well from the Housing Partnership Board. Um, I know a big component of this is the affordable housing component for us. Um, I know John's been pretty integral in um, how that uh, is being moved forward. Um, so um, John is here and answer questions as well, or ask questions, I guess. So option. I would just say, uh, Francis, thank you uh, for, uh, yeah, hello. And uh, thank you for uh, helping the town uh, with this. Uh, that's a site that has been uh, sitting underused uh, for many, many, many years. So uh, looking forward to the, uh, to the next step in the, in the process uh, at this point. Um, I don't have any questions, I'm sure as we move forward. There will be questions on timing, given the construction at the uh, train station and parking spots and all that. But uh, right now, it looks like uh, it's, everything's going well. Anyone else? And Mariana, it's always a pleasure. I've been working with Winchester for since since graduating from grad school now. So. <laughs> Yeah. It's 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 good um, it's good job security. We always have something pretty crazy going on, so um, <laughs> we're we're glad that yeah, you're here. <laughs> um, okay, so I do have a couple of a few questions. Um, so first of all, we know that the it will be the select board, so all of you will be the ones to decide who the uh, chosen developer will be, if there is one. Um, but there. There was the thought of having an RFP evaluation committee. So, um, you know, folks that will look at the different evaluation criteria um, and sort of give their recommendations to you as the board. Um, so the question was, who do you think should be part of it? Um, we've had the RFQ committee, and I think that there was at least some concern from at least some residents of the involvement level um, going into then choosing the developers. Um, so I think that the thought around this is um, there's a number of folks that um, are looking to either engage or re-engage considering how long this process has been um, 
and and also given you know COVID nineteen, I think not um, not everybody is um, sort of up to speed as to where we are, and would love to have this uh, final step for input. Um, so I mean, whatever whatever the developers put forward for proposals, we do plan to have um, a public meeting where they can see the proposals, ask questions and give their input. But in terms of a committee to help um, evaluate um, the proposals for the select board, this is the opportunity, for example, to bring in the Rangeley um, neighborhood group um, that was at the abutters meeting who expressed a desire to be part of the process uh, where we could have a number of, um, of different groups and representatives evaluate the proposals and then um, you know sort of be able to present those to the board for the board's final uh, decision. Um, so you'll certainly take the evaluation committee's recommendation into consideration, uh, public input, um, staff recommendations. So you'll you'll be getting you know a number of um, of different recommendations. I guess the question here is are um, would you like a formal evaluation committee? So that we can incorporate, um, you know, some of the abutter, some of the groups that want to be involved in the process. I think it'll be necessary for us, especially that we've had so much engagement, um, you know, throughout the um, process with the RFQ and the RFP. As long as we, um, you know, don't have uh, overload as far as um, who is engaged in the process. Certainly, um, you know, we've um, had. Uh, John Servier from Housing Partnership, uh, Marty Jones has been a part of it. Um, so um, it would be um, strange for us to not have the planning board formally weigh in on um, the um, recommendation. Um, Jeff Lowenberg from the Rangeley Ridge um, uh, Neighborhood Association, I don't know if that's their actual name, but um, it, he's representing that whole abutting um, area. Um, you, you know, we, we kind of suggested to him that, um, that they would be part of you know, this next process to kind of weigh in. And I, I think that um, if we kind of develop, um, you know, this um, this committee um, and, you know, keep it at a good size, um, we, it, it would probably be an enormous um, help to the, the select board as we, you know, kind of start evaluating some of these, um, these proposals. I um, completely agree. And I'd just like to say that, um, you know, hats off to the, committee so far, but um, but it is tricky to make those meetings during the day and there may be a whole population out there who would be representative and constructive and helpful to have input on um, who couldn't be in that capacity, who could still provide some great input for our board. So I agree with the chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so that being said, we would like to um, be able to, if not include who will be in the committee uh, for the RFP or send it out to the developers a couple of weeks after the um, RFP goes live. Um, that was Marty Jones suggested that it'd be better sooner rather than later to explicitly say, these will be the folks weighing in to the evaluation. And it might not be a specific person, meaning that it might be a member mm -hmm. from the planning board, a member from the design review, that that type of thing. These are typically evaluated in the past mostly by staff with board and committee, um, with boards and committees, you know, the chairs of boards and committees. It's typically, I'm not saying that we can't do it. I'm just saying if there's someone, for instance, that, you know, thinks big projects are bad, for example, um, but our, I mean, we, we, re, we really need people to evaluate the criteria as written. We don't necessarily, this is not necessarily the time where we elicit public feedback. I, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's maybe two things happening here. One is eliciting feedback that we need in order to pick a winner, let's say. But in terms of evaluating the criteria, we want the most boring people ever to be evaluating this criteria, meaning we don't, there, it's not supposed to be emotional or and it's not supposed to be having a side or not. It's, there's a list of criteria and 
typically, or the hope is that the cream always rises to the top and everyone kind of comes to the same conclusion because the criteria is written. So that's something you should take into consideration that if you want to bring in other groups outside of boards and committees that have very clear de defined roles and staff, which, you know, are, we're just doing our job, meaning there's no, there's no, um, there's no other angle there. So that's something to think about. That's a good point. I don't know if I'd agree with that characterization of people who may have passion for one thing or another on various sides. I think you definitely want people who are interested in, in trying to give some constructive comments, but, um, in addition to some folks who are already parts of some boards, I do think that if some people are just um, interested in what's going on in town center, that it's it's definitely relevant. I mean, they're they're, they're stakeholders just as much as anyone else. So, um, you know, for example, the master plan steering committee, somebody from that committee, I know Jennifer has been deeply involved in this, and she's deeply involved in master plan. But someone who's a uh, um, you know, who, who's not a consultant, but who's just a member of that committee. So I could think of a lot of people, but I think that um, um, I, I wouldn't want to count someone out just because they may be passionate about something one way or the other. Thanks. So one, one thing with uh, the evaluation criteria is that I, I, Jen is the expert here, but I do think that it has to be quite transparent um, because otherwise the town can open itself up for, uh, I don't know if it's lawsuits, it tends to be lawsuits, but I, I do know in the, and we just went through this process in a different town and you know you can't, you can't move away from the evaluation criteria in order to judge the actual project. But you know, if say there is the top three, then maybe once those top three are numerically chosen from all of you, then you know the conversation gets opened up. The developers can come and present their proposals, uh, and that's when the sort of committee can happen, where they decide from the top three that were numerically chosen who can proceed. So maybe we can have a staff recommendation on on you know what that process you know looks like um, at a certain point and who can contribute. I think Francis is right. We you know there there is some risk with um, a very prescriptive evaluation criteria like we have um, of a bid protest or something like that. So, um, you know, um, we do have to be a little bit careful, but as I said, I mean, there are, um, for, from, for our needs and the select board is making this decision in the end, um, you know, there, there has to be certain stakeholders in the room. And I think that the uh, uh, developers, you know, it's fair for them that, um, they understand who is going to be making these decisions as well, um, because it'll, it'll be a decision for them whether or not they will want to, um, you know, submit a proposal, um, you know, if it, um, in, they, they want to see that it's not, not too out there. Um, and it's, there's, you know, a group of people that they can, um, expect to be, uh, informed enough to, to make good recommendations. So that, that's it. So maybe, um, maybe we can have that that conversation and see what it looks like having a um, small um, evaluation committee. Um, does that uh, sound okay, at least? I don't, I don't know, or Brian. Right. And, 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 and the role is to assist the board, not make the decision for the board. That's right. So, well, so you're in charge, um, Jackie. So the idea is if you want to say, we're gonna get three to five people to evaluate the, the numbers, and then uh, to evaluate the proposals and then they'll come up with any number of top three top four whatever then pass those top three to four to you that's one way we could do it that's the way we had envisioned it but it's still i mean there's no right or wrong way here so the idea is yeah. that 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 was what was going to happen yeah i think that's a little maybe too much funneling i think just them putting you know in, in indicating kind of the what they view as for lack of a better way to put it for the sake of the current conversation, pros and cons, and um, whether it's complying with the RFP or anything else, that that's that's helpful for us to know. I think if if this you know sort of subgroup is going to end up funneling some, I I think that we're capable of doing that ourselves, and that if this group can assist us in providing their you know assessment, their outlook, that'll be great input for us to have as a board. But I don't. 
necessarily we should have um, a committee, you know, sort of narrowing the list for us. I think we're capable of doing that ourselves with their input. All right, so, so you should make it clear then what you want out of the committee, whether you want them new, um, coming up with numbers, meaning actually scoring the, that's the question. Do you want this group to score the RFP responses or not? I would say no. I, I would say we, it's more that we want their kind of observations and assessments that are sort of a little bit more narrative than a scoring. That mm -hmm. that kind of gets to what our board's doing. Anyway, that's my view. Thanks. So like an RFP review committee, and they basically tell you not the numerically, but just you know from their standpoint as the housing partnership board or as a Nevada which proposals they think are strong or, you know, no, no, to the, 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 the stronger or less strong features of each proposal. And then, mm -hmm. then our board can, you know, feel that that's helpful input to have. So like the pros and cons of each proposal uh, based on not the evaluation metrics that you will use, but more so from their, you know, whatever hat they're putting on it can be partly the evaluation metrics i just don't think that we should have them making conclusions or giving numbers because otherwise then it'll end up being their decision mm -hmm. i think i think if the the original idea was that you know would would a committee of some sort be helpful to our board and i think that's i would agree that is um potentially helpful but i don't think it's helpful if they're already narrowing and affixing numbers and stuff because then it just gets really difficult for us to de-layer and figure all that out and then we haven't made our own decision. But if they can, mm. whether they're using the same criteria or any different criteria, you know, um, indicate what seems to be, you know, favorable or unfavorable aspects depending on their perspective, I think that would be a helpful for our board. That's just my view. Um, so, I mean, I. I think it's important that we get uh, feedback from the community through a public hearing process. Um, I think that to have a separate committee that goes through this might just add additional uh, delay to a project that's been delayed so much. Um, and you know, like like the chair said, it's important for developers to know who will be making the decision. So. I think that anybody who has input into this is welcome to come to uh, the, you know, maybe we have two or three public hearings on it and then anybody who's interested is on it. But I think that setting up a separate committee, uh, you know, might not be necessary. I think we can take the public input and evaluate the responses uh, ourselves as a board. Amy, I saw you unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, Do I have a chance to comment? Uh, I've been impressed well, by the uh, care that has gone into the evaluation factors uh, and, and the definition of highly advantageous, advantageous, not advantageous, uh, and the choice of weights. Uh, and I don't think it's uh, an either or that uh, you rely entirely on the numbers uh, or you know, you're free to ignore all the evaluation criteria uh, on that. So putting my Meg White hat on for a moment, uh, I think it's very, very useful to go through a systematic evaluation such as Francis has described, such, uh, such as Brian uh, recommended. Uh, at the same time, uh, the purpose of the evaluation is to identify important trade-offs that exist uh, and to, uh, to come up with a kind of a supporting narrative, which is what Jackie was, was suggesting. So I think both, both can be done, but I think in terms of ensuring a fair and even evaluation, uh, it's useful to go through this scoring function. And I, and I, and I say that uh, based on my own career, I don't like scoring functions. Uh, so I'm not normally a fan of scoring functions, but uh, Meg White has convinced me that, that they're actually useful from a legal perspective uh, and a technical perspective. So I'd recommend that that be done. 
but uh, you don't want just a number. You want to know the advantages, the disadvantages, or the, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of each of the teams and the kind of trade-offs between, uh, between some of these considerations. Yeah, I, would, um, I was just gonna say that I think that um, is it, if there's a way that the select board can use the scoring mechanism to get like a top three and then go sort of use those three to do what Jackie's saying, where we get a little bit more you know, anecdotal um, input from residents and different people on different committees. I think that that would, would make sense. I, I just, I don't want the process to become too cumbersome, but at the same time, I think it's really important that we get the feedback from, you know, the people that have been working on this and, and that have, um, you know, legitimate concerns or um, suggestions. So that would be my recommendation is that we, we pull it down to maybe the top three and then we do the public hearings, as Mariano said, and then if there, you know, I don't think we need a committee, but I think that there's, we definitely need to provide an opportunity for people to come and speak um, and, you know, tell us what their thoughts are on those three. And maybe we provide our scoring, uh, if that's something that we would do to make that public so that they can understand where we're coming from for those three. Um, so that it's kind of, there, there's a baseline in terms of, you know, where we're coming from, from a scoring perspective. Mm -hmm. Those are public, and you would need to supply them those the the individual. So if the um so then just so I'm just going to put everything together here. So the idea is that the select board would be the evaluating body. They would be um, scoring these individually, and then there would be a tally amongst all the boards. There would be some whether it's three or four. You know there, that's the conversation amongst the board. The board will have three or four to unveil to the public. That's when not just boards and committees, but also um, you know, the uh, residents, just e everybody. That's when everyone would then be brought in and say, okay, these are the top three. Let's, we're gonna have a public hearing about it. So, so just so we're clear, so that, is that what everyone, because that, that sounds like everyone's going towards that. It's totally fine, but it is different. So we, should, we have to make it clear in the RFP that that the select board's actually the evaluating body. They're obviously always the ones making the final decision, but typically it's done by staff and boards and committees or with others. So we should just make that clear. It sounds like everything is fine. Just wanted to see, make sure that that was what everyone wanted. Well, maybe staff should be involved in the initial, you know, maybe it's not, maybe staff should be involved in the select board piece too. So the staff should also, you know, do the, do the measuring um, and then we all come together. And then I think also just to your point, Brian, um, as you were talking, I'm thinking the public hearings is definitely a necessity, but I also think maybe that we have a joint meeting with the planning board um, and maybe a couple other organizations, you know, boards and committees that, um, you know, want to have a, a, a more in-depth conversation about the RFP process and the, the candidates. Um, so maybe that's something that we look to fit into the schedule and the timeline as well. You're talking after the RFP closes between August 31st and town meeting, correct? So, so yeah, September, yeah. September, October, September, October. Yeah. No, no, I mean, everything's happening between September and October. We, we yeah. knew that. Yeah. But uh, my guess is it'd probably be one meeting that would have, okay, we get 30 minutes with the planning board, we get 30 minutes with design review, or whatever you guys want. Uh, and you just have one night where you do that because there's, yeah. it's not, you're not going to be able to do it during a normal select board Got meeting. It. There's not going to okay. be enough time. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, I just think, I, think, I, think you, I love your recommendation on what those boards and committees. We, we, we should be having a joint meeting with the planning board at some point soon anyway, because we haven't had one in a while. So mm -hmm. that probably dovetails with something we should, you know, probably do maybe in early September anyway. All right. So, um, okay. So it, um, it looks like there was a few more questions that we had to get through, Francis. I think that was the big one. Yeah, that was the, definitely the big one. And yep. I think that you made the right choice. <laughs> that involving a lot of people early on makes things take a lot longer. Um, but I think having all of you weigh in with the numerical you know, data sort of based metrics and then opening it up. And we can definitely have not just 
you know, grand public meetings, but target specific, you know, the neighborhood association, different members that we know are going to be involved in addition to um, having the, the board meetings. Um, and, you know, we can bring in the three developers. I mean, it's much easier to bring in people through Zoom. So we can definitely have a, a strong process, um, but I think it's, it will be a little easier um, and legally easier if you all weigh in first. So that's great. Um, and that sort of goes into the community engagement question. I think the only issue is uh, parking. Um, I know that it's, you know, we are doing this because it's an underutilized spot. We know that the MBTA is basically closing off a lot of those areas anyways for all the construction work, um, but parking is a very sticky issue. So I think that once we have the public meetings, it'll be something that comes up a lot. And, you know, any other, any either actions that the select board encourages in order to mitigate um, the parking loss or, you know, any statements around it um, should be, would be useful. Yeah, I, I would just sort of add. I don't. I don't know if that's an actual question to us, but um, as as Mr. Goloboff has has said, and our chair, and also Ms. Shapiro, and I'm sure Ms. Verdicchio would agree as well. We're all very familiar with the site, so I think that's why you know we're we're um, with the benefit of other input as well that we feel that we want to be part of that evaluation process. Thank you. Are there any other questions or um, comments for uh, Brian or Francis or anyone? I actually had one more question. Sorry, it's not on this slide, but one thing that we went over, we had a meeting today with the Waterfield Working Group. And one thing that came up that um, that was addressed in the public hearing, uh, and in the public um, meeting about the RFP was when a, when the town would be hiring some type of a, it, it's very it's anticipated that an outside design consultant would be used on this project. It's a large project right in the middle of the center business district. There's no doubt that a outside consultant would be used. And the question from um, this resident was, well, is that gonna happen right away or when is that gonna happen? What we talked about today was that it probably seemed most likely that a design consultant would be hired when a uh, like very soon after the um, some a, a, a firm was picked in order so that the town can start um, working with this developer hand in hand rather than the, having them kind of go off on something and then not working not be working with the town or not necessarily what the town wants so it was uh, the idea of should we be mentioning that we would be hiring an outside consultant to be working with the applicant, you know, soon after the award is given. Brian, that's a great idea, um, I think, personally. And I like the way you articulated that, um, that you really presented that point extremely well. So thank you. Well, I won't take credit for it. Wasn't my idea, but- uh, um... well, you, you, you articulated <laughs> to the point very precisely and um i appreciate it i yeah it was a it was a very good point um not mine again but um i think it is important to bring in a design consultant in early because there's less fighting it costs them less money the more work that they do before so that they don't kind of get their heels dug in and they're like well this is what we've been doing for the past two months so so i think it does make sense i think we, sh we should put it in there i think that would, that's the only other question that i had for the group Sounds great. Um, thanks, Brian. Um, Francis, did you have anything else, or I think we might we might be oh, good. That's it. Thank you all so much. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, and yeah, no, have a good night. We'll be in touch, uh, and let's definitely uh, let's definitely get the planning board more involved. And um, yeah, we'll just keep working on this, and we'll just keep meeting through Zoom. Great. Thank you, Francis, for all your commitment to the town and hard work. And same with you, Mr. Sakai. Um, anytime. Have a good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks. Thank you. Um,
Um, unfortunately, we don't get to go because we still have some other business to take care of. Um, uh, Lisa, was there anything that um, we wanted to, to jump to here? Uh, we still have a couple open items. Yes, yeah, so uh, we've got the committees and commissions. Um, we also have uh, an event on Friday um, that we're trying to figure out. And uh, so I'll need the board to consider and vote on whether um, you wanna support a Black Lives Matter flag raising at the town common. Um, the timing might work as early as this Friday, it might be later, but I uh, would love to sort of get your direction on, on whether this is something you wanna pursue. I think too, we had um, discussed the, um, in conjunction with that, a uh, pride flag um, being raised um, as well. So um, just a couple, um, a couple conversations around those things. The flags themselves, I think, um, um, I, I think the, the Juneteenth uh, event on the common will definitely happen. The flags may not um, be available until the following week, but certainly the, um, the spirit behind both of them um, are, um, you know, are, is available to us. Yeah. Can I just ask you a quick question? Is that like a permanent kind of flag or are you envisioning sort of for a certain time period? A certain time period, uh, the the Pride flag would be for uh, Pride Month, um, and the Black Lives Matter flag would, um, I think, be a duration that all of us would see fit. Um, I think it's that one's a bit harder because it really um, it's not really tied to anything. It, it's certainly a symbol of of something the town wants to. Um, think about um, spark discussion and um, enact change. And that is a short, medium and a long-term um, goal. So, but, but I think that the, the intent was um, that this is Pride Month, but it's also a very relative, relevant conversation. And, uh, you know, the Juneteenth um, is, uh, is certainly, um, an occasion that that uh, I think would be would be fitting um, in terms of making a proclamation, making a statement um, about the the actions that we would want to take moving forward. And just to clarify too, I know that um, Black Lives Matter um, has a couple different um, flags. This would be the one that just has the um, the lettering and the um, kind of. Uh, uh, black and white bands so there's one that has like a fist on it like we wouldn't we would do that one um so um i think that there's been uh, most communities that are doing this um are um not choosing to use um that one so just as a point of information well to me this sort of follows on um after the um the statement that we signed on to with the um Network for Social Justice to sort of react to the, um, you know, the George Floyd killing and um, deploring pr police brutality and and the sort of um, context within um, systemic racism. And I think having this sort of coincide with Juneteenth is an important moment. We um, we just want to make a statement in support of moving forward on this. This is, uh, you know, we don't want to lose this moment and um, we want to really support some real uh, concrete steps uh, sort of tied into the, um, the set of le uh, legislation proposed by the Black and um, Latino um, Legislative Caucus in the state. And there's, there's also some proposals that um, are embodied in or referred to in, by in um, Ayanna Presley's resolution. Um, th these are important and it's, it's beyond time to make some real changes. Not that they're directed at any specific um, 
department and, and or people within Winchester, but just to support people of color in Winchester and in the Boston region and nationally. So I think it's it, it'd be really great to be able to do something on Juneteenth. And I think it's important for us to, you know, message that, you know, that we experience all this in a different way in Winchester. And um, part of it is, um, you know, it, expressing that um, we do support our uh, police department and this is not a reflection um, at the, the local level on anything that they have done or any of our concerns about um, things they've done, but, you know, having a, uh, creating a long-term um, discussion of, um, what um, our um, police force looks like, what our response looks like, what um, our um, position descriptions look like, and, um, uh, and, and how we kind of uh, evaluate it at the local level. So, um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter group does, uh, you know, they they're, um, have a very specific, um, you know, kind of ideology and that kind of is connected to a, a lot of the racial justice um, conversations that we've been having. So, um, you know, it's, um, we, we will probably, you know, hear some, um, some feedback, you know, from, from people, um, doing this and, um, it's probably a, a, a conversation that, that we need to have, but also with keeping in mind that it's, um, uh, our, you know, we, we are in a position in, that we are quite fortunate where we don't, um, you know, our police force happens to be, um, work with us very closely and um, supports us in the community. So, um, I, um, I mean, I mean, I think, um, I, I think it's a statement that we need to make. I think that doing it on Juneteenth is especially important. Um, and I agree with everybody else that I think it will uh, create conversations, and they are conversations that we need to have, even in a privileged community such as ours. Uh, racism is everywhere. And um, I think that um, being able to have a conversation about it, we, as, as we've learned, um, well, I, I think a lot, as it's become apparent to a lot more people in recent, uh, due to recent events, I think this has been learned over decades or hundreds of years by many, but um, racism is not something that we can just wish it didn't happen and not talk about. Um, it's a conversation that we need to have. It's a conversation that we need to continue to have. Um, so I'm 100% in support of uh, having the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter flag on the common and um, hopefully on, um, you know, hopefully we can do it this Friday, but if not, um, you know, any time after that. I agree with what everyone has said. I think that, um, you know, for me, um, I don't want, and I don't mean it this way, but I don't want to just hang up a flag and then, you know, have that be our gesture. I think that what mm. is really important is that behind the, the flags that we raise is that we're fostering education and conversation, just like you said, Mariano, discussion, um, having hard discussions, but that is the, that's what's going to change things. And so I just don't want to lose sight of that. I think the flag is something we can do. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm in support of it, but I just hope that we and the network for social justice and everyone, um, you know, that really is standing up and, and is showing both solidarity and understanding and, you know, trying to further understand, especially in a place like Winchester, um, that there's a there's a um, component of education that we're also promoting and working toward. So I just I want to just you know I think if we if the board's decision to hang the flag and in, in support of that, but I also just want to make sure that we're we're not losing sight of the opportunity that we have to really educate and have co conversations some that are going to be uncomfortable but really really important. Yeah, thanks, Amy. I, I think to um, and anybody else, you know, to jump in as well. Um, you know, we, we um, had discussed having kind of a um, a static agenda item uh, on uh, our agenda um, relative to um, racial justice issues, and 
Um, so we don't lose sight of it and we are um, filtering our work through that lens and we are having conversations with our police officers in the community. And um, I think the network for social justice is um, gonna work with us on um, you know, also having a broader community um, conversation um, about it as well. So um, because there is that risk that you're just um, hanging a, a token flag up and um, you're not doing the work um, that's part of it. And, um, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, I think uh, us having the select board, um, having some, you know, actual engagement and conversations with our police officers um, about this stuff um, is helpful because um, we really don't want to send a message that this is a uh, us versus them um, kind of thing, because I, I think they could feel um, like we are targeting um, them, which is not um, the point of what we're doing, um, you know, in, in Winchester anyway. And um, this is not a, um, you know, defund the police message. Um, it's, you know, we, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and, you know, it's, it's that we need to kind of work, um, you know, work together to make the, the you know, the best policing for um, our community and, and what we all think that that needs, uh, means and, and, and what we need. So um, just putting that out. Can I just ask a quick question? Is this what you just, did you share this, um, chair, Mr. Chairman? And is that Mass Municipal? I don't know what that is. Um, what is it that's on? Oh, uh, so um, I think we're, we're talking about two parts. So one is just the, uh, term, the permission uh, to raise um, the pride and the Black Lives Matter flags at the town common um, for this month. And then um, a work on some sort of uh, proclamation or commitment. And I just wanted to share with you something that um, I've been working on recently. So I'm part of the, um, the triple MA. So it's the, um, it's the, 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 man the municipal managers, um, Association, part of the MMA Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion. And we drafted this statement that we sent out to uh, the entire MMA membership that, um, and you can sort of see in the screen, it's um, a, a lot of commitments in what we, uh, we hope to do. And these are very broad statements. Uh, and we've got another meeting coming up this week where our agenda item, uh, our agenda is a little bit more, um, robust in terms of looking at action steps, but this was sort of a first step, very similar to the statement that um, that the select board put out there. Uh, and then this is sort of our, our group um, sort of asking for uh, policy suggestions. And then um, our next step is sort of putting those into concrete action. So that's, that's sort of the work that I'm doing as a town manager with other town managers. Um, I just wanted to share that with you in case um, this might be kind of a similar um, sort of simple presentation. Um, I think the the bottom line is that we don't have any, you know, we don't have any real answers and actions that we can implement um, right away that is going to solve um, a lot of the underlying issues that exist. But um, I think making making the commitment. Um, or making a proclamation on certain things is 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 a good next step to take um, along with my raising. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for you know your work on that uh, task force and sharing you know the the progress. This is um, it's this is really helpful to to know about, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, Lisa, thank you. That's, that's really good. It's that it's, it's a commitment and it's about conversations and um, supporting movement on uh, anti-racist work. I think that's great. That's helpful. We definitely don't want to just put up a flag or get together and, you know. So I am, I am having some meetings this week. Um, I've had many, many conversations with the police chief. Um, I haven't had as many conversations with the unions. Um, I'm actually gonna be meeting with them tomorrow and um, you know, having, um, you know, having some hard conversations with them about um, what's going on in the world and what our role is. So 
I'm hoping to have more, more feedback and more insight as to what makes sense for Winchester. Um, you know, not just doing something that's sort of broad or general, but doing something that's genuine and authentic to our community. Um, I'm hoping to come back with some suggestions for all of you. So I think what I need from you tonight is just, um, if you don't mind, a, sort of a, a blank check or mm -hmm. a, a little blank, blank check for me to hang some flags up at town at the town common. Um, and then, um, well, it's, it's, it's something that we would do. I mean, I, I think it's, the, you know, it's the select board. It's not just the function of it. I mean, there's an event. Um, so, I mean, I, I think if we're, if there's consensus that we, we move forward with the flag raising, that's it. I mean, I think we should be engaged with, you know, as elected officials, um, you know, with the union, with the police officers and, um, hear what they have to say as well. I mean, it's, um, it, it's not just a, um, you know, we come up with a series of a few recommendations and then we vote on them and then we move them forward. It's, you know, um, you know, I, I, would really like this to be a, um, a conversation with them. I know, um, the police chief has been, um, very engaged in these conversations, certainly with the, with the network, um, over a period of time, he's done a lot of, um, trainings with us and everything. And, um, um, and I've really learned quite a bit, um, from him, you know, personally. Um, and so, um, I think there's value in that and, and the community being part of those those conversations and to um, hear that we're we are thinking about these things and um, that each uh, each community is 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 definitely different. Um, so um, you know it's difficult to paint paint a um, a broad brush. And so um, you know if if we are able to have that conversation with you know some of the officers and um, uh, you know, the police chief, I'm sure, would be willing to do that as well. I mean, um, I think it would be um, part of the work that, that we need to do, um, as well as um, I would hope that if everybody is available to attend, attend the, the Juneteenth uh, event um, on Friday. Um, so, Mike, you're actually, you're, you're segueing to uh, my next question, which is, um, I know that this this uh, is going to be something that we're going to make regular progress at at select board meetings, but uh, in the interim, I wasn't sure if um, you wanted to see if a board member or two um, would like to um, sort of be part of an informal task force, you know, to work with um, town staff and other interested folks in um, some of the policy work that we want to do. You know, it's funny as I, I did think about that. Um, you know, I think that um, you know we, I think we should all be a, a part of it to the degree that um, some of these conversations are you know um, ongoing over a period of time. Um, so um, you know, I know that it, it it can make it difficult when we've got to host meetings if you know we're all there and um, all of that. And certainly, people can take the lead on certain things, but um, you know, I don't want to exclude. Um, any of the members of the board from this conversation, especially as I said, it's um, it's a learning opportunity um, for all of us. Um, so, um, and you know, for the community. I mean, I certainly uh, would want to be a part of that conversation, but wouldn't want to exclude other board members if we said only two people are doing it. You know, um, so it seems valuable for for all of us to be you know, uh, developing the same language and the same conversation and having the same understanding of, um, you know, how policing works in, in Winchester and um, what what needs to happen. And, um, you know, even when we're, we're evaluating school budgets and things like the, um, you know, how the school resource officer, you know, plays into, um, um, you know, policy at, on the school side. Um, you know, I know we've funded positions at the high school, uh, at least the town has um, funded positions at the, um, the high school and the middle school, um, you know, um, and what does that mean? You know, are we are we engaging um, our our officers um, to um, have um, you know mental health uh, background? Or you know, what are our our um, position descriptions look like? Things like that. Um, it, it's just helpful to have that, that conversation in public. So I know some of the meetings, like the meeting I'm having tomorrow. Uh, you know, we had a lot of scheduling conflicts, so we, uh, you know, we, we scheduled it with less than 24 hours notice. So um, there, there are some of the work that I think might not be as possible to do as a, as a whole group, just because of, um, 
you know, meeting notices. So, uh, but I can, I can certainly keep you informed. Um, and if there is, uh, you know, an opportunity for um, some of you to join, um, then I think that makes sense. I think part of the conversation tomorrow is going to um, kind of shape uh, the, the involvement that um, a lot of people have asked me to ask the, the unions to get involved with, including um, our state delegation um, and the public um, and various nonprofits and elected officials. So um, I think part of my role is just sort of to, um, to broker these conversations as well as to um, you know, help, um, uh, you know, help, help lead in terms of what we can do to make changes. Thank you. Lee. Thank you, town manager. We're so grateful for all of your hard work always, but especially as you've just articulated. Yeah. I mean, I think that we can have a conversation too as a board and figure out who really, I mean, who you feel like they want to be part of those conversations and who is more who's comfortable with being informed about what's happening um, and certainly being able to share thoughts and, um, you know, opinions about what's going on. But I, I, you know, Lisa, I wouldn't want to slow up the process, but I also think this, this is a really important issue that I think we all have probably slightly different um, thoughts on how we want to be involved. So I just would want to make sure that the board feels like every single person has whatever opportunity they want to or feel important feels important to participate. Um, so I mean, I can speak for myself. I mean, I, this is very important to me. Um, but I'm also, you know, at a point where I feel like I have a lot to do on my own from for myself. Um, and I would love to be informed, and I would love to participate and be um, a sounding board for anything. But I don't need to be in every meeting. So like the, those types of conversations, maybe as a board, we can have them. And figure out who, you know, really does feel like they want to be involved in a much in a deeper way. Just my two cents. Yeah, thanks, Amy. I, I just, like I said, I mean, I just don't want to put the. Um, I didn't know that there was a meeting tomorrow, so I, I didn't know. Um, you know, I think it's important for um, us as you know elected officials and. Um, residents of the town to be able to, um, you know, have the conversation with, um, you know, some of our officers um, and express to them that we're, you know, we're not looking to just paint a broad brush, you know, um, over something and, or even rush to a conclusion. I think that that's, I think there's a lot of pressure around that, um, you know, with the, the, um, the public dialogue and discourse. And so, um, you know, and, and working with the network and, you know, working with, you know, reaching some recommendations collaboratively, um, you know, with the select board and um, with the police officers. Um, so I think um, uh, because we are, you know, we are going to get pushback as well um, that we will have to own. Um, and so um, I feel better um, taking that risk and owning it personally. Um, so um, that is just my perspective. Um, I don't know anyone else. Uh, I mean, I, you know, this is obviously, it's something very important to me as well. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to be as um, engaged as possible and um, part of the, the listening process and the collaborative process with the, um, with the police officers and not even, not even just with union representatives. I mean, I think that's one kind of contractual way to start the, the conversation. But just with all of the officers who want to also be a part of the conversation, whether they're whether it's in context of the union or not, what it, what have been your experiences? What are your concerns? I can't imagine what it must feel like to be, you know, in the police force and committed to a um, a career and a profession of serving and protecting for your whole life, and then to turn on the TV and see that you know uh, a lot of people hate you and what you do, and um, and you don't feel like you've ever been a part of any of that. Um, so that's something that I you know. I, you know, we need to have that conversation as well, that it's, there's a give and take and it's not just, I don't want them to feel like we're just coming down on them um, because that's not, um, I don't think it's constructive. Uh, so I would say that 
all the messages that all of you have just conveyed are uh, exactly the sentiments that um, that I feel and that I can also convey. Um, like I said, tomorrow is, is basically just a logistical meeting. Uh, it's not to, to do all of that work. It's just to say that uh, you know, there typically isn't an opportunity for the public to fully engage with all of the officers um, and all the officers might not be used to, to doing it that way. So part of, I think what we're looking at is to say that the typical forms of dialogue, whether they're um, just, you know, just the school resource officer or just, you know, uh, the chief or just the union reps uh, is, is probably not going to cut it for these kinds of conversations. So I think part of the feedback that I'm trying to get tomorrow is exactly, um, you know, is to kind of to share ideas and say, you know, what um, what works in terms of a a forum um, to make sure that everyone's voices is heard, both um, you know, in the public and in the police department. Um, what are some ideas that they have for engagement that might have worked in the past? What are some things that we want to try moving forward? Uh, you know, how do they feel about um, you know engaging in you know, in panel conversations or in, in charrettes, you know, can we get, um, you know, officers to, to volunteer to do these things who might not typically do. So again, it's not just like the, the same community representatives, but it's also, um, you know, not a, an opportunity for some people in the police force to, to engage even deeper. Um, so we, we just we just haven't had a lot of those initial conversations or I, I've had those conversations with the chief, but we haven't had them sort of as like a round table with the union. So it'll be sort of a very logistical meeting. Um, I can share the sentiments that you share and then also, um, you know, try to try to talk with them about exactly what they want to do. Like I said, I know that the state senator is is hoping to include them in conversation. Um, I've talked with Lior about about what involvement they could have in the community dialogues they're doing. Um, I know that you want to um, engage them in conversation as well. So I mean, Lisa, that seems to be the key word. Like, what is the forum? What, how, how are we going to have this conversation? And let's. Um, it sounds like you've you've set up a good meeting tomorrow for for them to talk to you and to sort of um, envision this together. So um, that's the that's the best first step that I can think of. As well. Um, so just one last thing in terms of uh, um, in terms of um, like a, a proclamation um, or you know document or action mm -hmm. um, steps to be announced on Friday. Um, Leo, Leo and I have been in a lot of discussions, and I would like to include um, if I do get any feedback tomorrow, it's going to be one of the questions that I'll ask um, the the unions if if. Um, they've been involved in any statements that they want to share or how they want to be engaged. Um, but I know we don't have any meetings between now and Friday. So uh, do you want this document to be shared um, where I sort of share it with you without, you know, breaking any open meeting logs? I can share it with you individually and you can give me your individual feedback. Um, what are your thoughts about just making sure that we've got that right? I don't know. I mean, I it's my sense that I, you know we don't need so much of a a, a proclamation. Um, you know, I, I think that that's you know can be overwrought. I think um, to the degree that um, as many of as possible can be in attendance, and you know we can be part of that conversation. I think that that's that's helpful. I, I don't think it's going to be a a really a, a long drawn out event, um, to be honest with you. And um, but. Um, you know, if there is anybody that, you know, wants to speak from the board or say anything, I think it's, it's, um, it's appropriate, so. So one thing that would be incredibly helpful, like I didn't know anything about the Friday event and I didn't know about the, the um, rally, I guess it was a week ago. Is there, I don't know where I'm missing all of this or what Facebook page I'm not on for this, but I'm wondering if Lisa, if there's a way that um, you could just get some support on, of understanding what what's happening because I would never want to miss something because I didn't know about it. Um, like for instance, on Friday, what, what I didn't know anything about it. What time is it? You know, 
what do we have is there an agenda who's running it is it Lior running it or I think it's the network and, and you know it's been kind of a moving target for a little while we thought we we're going to do you know something what was it last week or something and I think it's just um everybody trying to plan out exactly what it's going to be so it may and it may be that it's just you know Friday I think in the um the afternoon maybe around noon and um middle of the day and um it'll there'll be some you know people speaking and it's likely that we won't even have the physical flags there to do that um but we you know we'll have that that conversation um just because uh it's just takes longer to get things now you know um so um, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Leora, but um, what she told me is she didn't envision this to be an event. Um, the vigil was an event that this was just uh, that this was just something that we would do. So we would raise the flag and, you know, send out a press release and sort of mark the occasion with, uh, um, you know, kind of a, a new statement that was um, sort of more uh, action oriented. So that was uh, that was that was her thought process, and I think part of it is the network's bandwidth to put on an event is very slim, um, given that they have a whole bunch of dialogues going on that they they plan the vigil and they've got they've got a lot on their plate. And they thought, um, you know, physical event where everybody came back out again probably wouldn't be the best, um, you know, the, the best transition in terms of um, uh, you know going towards more dialogue. <clears throat> I think they're looking for. Um, you know, to mark an occasion and then to, to spark conversation rather than have another event where like people are being spoken to. So if you're, if you're thinking about something, a press release or a, pro or a proclamation that's very short and streamlined along the lines of what you showed <laughs> from the um, triple MA, that would make sense just to mark the occasion of Juneteenth and starting a conversation within Winchester. Yeah, I don't know if I wanna do another <clears throat> proclamation at this point. I mean, we, no. we, we signed the letter. No. I okay. think I, um, I, I mean, I was thinking, you know, if we, if we hang the flags up, what if we create, what if there's a space created on the common where people can just sit, reflect? Like what if there's a area where that's, I just think maybe an event isn't the right thing. Um, I don't know, but I'm just wondering what else can we do to sort of commemorate what the flags mean um, and allow people to kind of think about that. And I guess I'm like getting very, I don't know, getting very heavy or whatever, but I just feel like if that, that's an opportunity to sit under those flags and really think about what they mean. And if that's the start of whatever we're gonna do moving forward in terms of education and having these conversations I think that that's really powerful and I don't think it has to be speeches or a proclamation I think it's mm -hmm. more subtle but this is just me my thought yeah I think that's what the you know the network had kind of intended as well um to um be a um you know, softer um, kind of event, uh, I keep saying event, I mean, occasion or, um, uh, you know, where we, um, you know, kind of come together to um, start um, what is going to kick off a lot of further um, dialogue and, uh, and action. And so I think that's part of why we've been kind of connecting with the network a little bit more is because they, um, you know, this is what they do. And it's a little bit um, on the town side, a little bit um, out of our lane. So, you know, hopefully to help facilitate that process with not with just us, but with the community. So um, we're, when we do hang a flag and we do spark that conversation and we do make that, you know, significant value statement that we're not just, um, we're not just sitting back and that we're, um, holding ourselves accountable to that and, um, you know, on a regular basis. So, um, which I hope we can do.
So, um, and we can get some more uh, information from Leora and from the network and, um, you know, but I think it's, um, um, does it seem like something everybody is comfortable with? Okay. I mean, it seems a little amorphous, but um, I think it's an important occasion that we commemorate Juneteenth, gather to reflect on its significance and the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement that we are seeing around the country and the world. And then I don't know what the third is, what the third thing is to commit to uh, further dialogue, something like that. Yeah, I think season two, you know, as we did, had talked about, you know, earlier today, um, you know, kind of having that be, and I know that I talked to Michelle and school committee as well about, you know, having this kind of specific agenda item where we're working, you know, together um, on it to move us forward and to, um, you know, keep that in our sight lines. Um, so we're, you know, if we're making decisions about school funding or whatever it is um, that it's, uh, it's right in front of us, um, because I think it's so easy for it, us to um, let it fall off the radar. And, um, you know, it's, um, and I think that would be um, a shame, you know, so anyway. Um, well, I'm free on new at noon on, on Friday, so. And, and, and feel like too, you know, a lot of these network events, you know, are about kind of sharing and not necessarily about um, making a speech, you know, it's more about just saying how you feel. And I think that's important as well um, for um, people to hear that um, we are um, thinking about these things. Um, we've heard from the community. Um, we, we are concerned, um, and we don't have all the answers, um, and, um, you know, but, um, hopefully we can move towards something together. So I, I would assume any of the board members that are there that want to have a conversation as much as anybody that's, you know, intending to, to be there can, can certainly speak and say something. I can work with that. Great. All right, last but not least, um, there's a committee and commissions. Is there a, do you wanna go over any of these or do, what, do we wanna wait until um, yeah, the end of the signing? The only person that you need to do tonight um, is to yeah. recommend Ann Stower and that's it. Okay. Every no one else was coming. They were all told that they um, were tabling it for the next, uh, for a future meeting. And for those of you that don't um, know Anne, I mean, um, she is really um, just uh, a kick-ass member of the Conservation um, Commission and um, just a force there and is somebody that has uh, always rises to the top in whatever context um, possible. So, um, um, you know, I'm glad that she wasn't here waiting around all night for us to, to get to her um, because she does so much for the town already. Um, and she's certainly somebody, if you don't know her, that is um, necessary for us to keep on the Conservation Commission, whether she um, whether she likes it or not. Um, so. so you're looking for a motion. <laughs> sure. So I move that we reappoint and store to the Conservation Commission for a new term to expire on March 31st, 2023. Second. Take a roll call vote. Uh, all in favor, Jackie? Yes. Mariano? Yes. Susan? Yes. Amy? Yes. And yes, for me, the motion carries unanimously five to zero. Um, I don't think if there's anything yeah, else that. You did kick off in the motion, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we can be amended, um, so. <laughs> Um, but, um, let's see, uh, have some minutes or something. <laughs> yeah. It's a degree that people are, uh, up to speed with the, the minutes for those meetings. Um, does anybody have any questions or corrections? You know, we can approve them. So 
So I move that we approve the minutes for the meetings of March 9th, March 23rd, and March 30th, 2020. I second, and just to the extent anyone has like a Scrivener's or a typo or something that they notice, I just have one incredibly minor thing that I'll mention to Patty offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, did we, did we get a second? second? Oh, yeah. second. Okay, thanks. Um, roll call vote, Jackie? Yes. Mariano? Yes. Amy? Yes. Susan? Yes. And uh, yes for me, um, uh, five in favor, um, five to zero motion carries unanimously. Um, uh, is there anything else uh, on the, the board side that we wanted to um, uh, discuss? So um, I, I know that we have the Thompson Street closure um, assessment um, on there. So we've got a kind of, um, as I said before, we probably need a little bit more of a, a sample to know what the, um, you know, we've only had a few days of that really um, being into effect, but you know, we have seen, we have received um, some positive and some negative feedback. So um, I don't know how the board wants to, to deal with that. It's, um, it is such a, a fluid situation for us that, um, you know, it's, um, you know, we, need to kind of respect everyone's, um, you know, comments and um, praise and criticism. So um, did anybody have any comments or anything? Yeah, I just, I think that um, if we can have um, Lisa, somebody kind of reach out to the, the two in particular that sent us a note um, and just kind of ask them. And I was just trying to think off the top of my head without really knowing their businesses very well, just trying to figure out is there anything we can do to mitigate what they're talking about? And the answer may be no, particularly with some of the other things that are going on, like the waterfront bridge and things like that. But just um, maybe just having a conversation with, with them to start, um, because I want to make sure that they know that we hear them and that we're going to take that into account. But I think Mike's right. I mean, I think we need another weekend at least of data to figure out, I mean, from you know looking at restaurants, last weekend it was pretty awesome um so we do have to balance it but i i think it would be really great if, if somebody lisa could reach out and um at least just have a conversation about is there anything in the short term that we can do to help them um as we continue to evaluate the, the situation so we'll just... and i can i can certainly have those conversations I, i've already spoken to the one retailer i haven't circled yet back to the restaurant um because i was trying to get a little bit more information on exactly um um you know what happened and also what we can do mm -hmm. so i can i can certainly do that um and i did also reach out to the chamber and i just asked them if they had heard of any feedback one way or the other so uh, uh most of it was uh most of it was positive so Can I just ask a super quick question? Has um has has there been any feedback on whether or not businesses who are not on Thompson Street can take advantage of the closing of Thompson Street? You know, or whether or not some of the restaurants not on Thompson Street desire more space. It's okay if we haven't received any information like that but i as we keep going with this i'll just be kind of curious about that because if you're not located on thompson street yeah. have that kind of natural um extra space that was identified earlier today by uh black horse tavern so i was just kind of curious so just the the initial feedback that i got was not necessarily that um they that the closure of Thompson Street gave them more space, but that it helped attract people downtown. And um, and and the one the the places that were not on Thompson Street therefore benefited from that. I get that totally. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, retail has been hurt so much. I mean, and it's been for years, right? Uh, between online shopping. And uh, now, obviously, with COVID nineteen, is you know what we need is for people to be in the town center. And um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was there yesterday, uh, there were so many people just walking down Thompson Street that 
uh, I think it's a great opportunity for retail stores to bring people that are there for other reasons to come in and, and shop when they when they walk by. I know that Sundays, most uh, a lot of the retail stores are closed, but I think that if any of them would want to use like the sidewalk uh, to put uh, goods, since we have the street open for uh, pedestrians, I think that's something that uh, the board could consider uh, applications from retailers to to open up their stores out onto the sidewalk so that they can um, further benefit from uh, having the street closed. That's a great idea. Thank you for mentioning that. So I, I did um, just have one um, update that's kind of related to reopening, but it's actually the reopening of town buildings that I wanted to run by the board. So I don't know if there's any further comments on Thompson Street or if I can I can move on. Don't go ahead. Okay, so uh, right now uh, we're, we're treating every building, <clears throat> sorry. So we're, we're trying to be consistent in, in our policies, but at the same time, we need to treat every building a little differently. Um, because you know the public works building works differently than recreation, the library works different than the public safety building, um, and so on and so forth. So one of the things that um, we're working through now is um, we're we're by appointment only in um, DPW, the public safety building, town hall, um, library is doing curbside uh, recreation. There's really just you know a, a handful of staff there and they're trying to restart programs. Um, so in terms of the public touch, uh, I think the, and we're working with the Jenk Center too, but you know, we, we don't own that building. So we're, we kind of work with them and the Board of Health on, um, you know, helping them think through how to, how to serve seniors. Um, so the, I think the library and the recreation are going to be the next to um, start to see more, um, more interaction in terms of a future phase having um, people be able to actually go into the library um, with rules and then recreation obviously we're, we're trying to get um, get some programs off the ground uh, you know trying to encourage more outdoor activity especially during the summer but for <clears throat> but for town hall um, and uh, DPW and, and the public safety building the Right now, the by appointment only is, is working fairly well. Um, we were trying to figure out whether it made sense to try to do limited hours. You know, there we've had some complaints about people who have come and obviously wanted to get in uh, and, and couldn't. Um, they were still able to do what they needed to do. It just, you know, they had to go online or they had to work with us um, curbside or, or do something differently. But um, you know, we, I, you know, was having a conversation with employees and um, thinking about the potential second wave, but also, um, uh, you know, fall being flu season. Uh, you know, we do have employees um, in certain departments and in some cases it's the majority or um, sometimes all the departments who are medically compromised in some way. They're in they either have a medical condition or they're over a certain age or they're basically in the in the category of stay at home and um, and the stay at home order is actually still in place. It doesn't seem like it, but it's actually still in place. So we would like to move forward at least at town hall with um, investigating like uh, basically a curbside windows. So instead of saying we're gonna like open up on Mondays and Fridays, um, which might not make sense because I think the public is not going to remember <laughs> exactly when we're open limited hours and when we're not is to instead explore um, like basically creating service windows. So I was thinking um, like one by the treasurer's office because um, it is under, you know, under um, the roof line, but it's also near the treasurer's office, which makes it helpful. And then maybe one in the rear that's more AD accessible, you know, adding a phone back there. Um, so I don't know if you if you have any sort of thoughts. We're, we're not in any rush to to open up more than we need to, but at the same time, 
we do want to be responsive to the public needs. Um, and, you know, like I said, I've heard a couple of complaints, but nothing that has prevented somebody from eventually getting what they need done. It's just, you know, a, a convenience factor. So I just wasn't sure if the board had any, any thoughts one way or the other about the opening of town buildings. Whatever is, I mean, I think consistent with um, what the health department thinks, you know, makes sense for uh, for town hall. I mean, um, I, I haven't heard um, I, I haven't heard any complaints um, from people. I think that there's an expectation that things are um, closed, and I know the building department does have a drop off um, in in some fashion, you know. At, Rubbermaid tub back there or something that um, people have been have been using for um, applications. So I think um, you know it seems like it's been going along well. Yeah, I would just say um, thank you for all your efforts and your leadership here, um, um, town manager, because this is very tricky for all the obvious reasons, and a lot of businesses are doing all kinds of different things. I mean, some are having you know even just anyone who enters a building have to do some like kind of quick um, test and have it, you know, um, uploaded on a Q code before they even walk in a building and then others even getting your hair cut, you have the sort of thermometer scan, you know, temperature scan. So um, it's, I, I, I guess the, the best thing is just to know that, you know, there's going to be some trial and error and there might have to be adjustments, especially if, um, you know, obviously we hope it doesn't happen that there's a second wave, but obviously there'll just have to be some agility in case, you know, depending on on what happens um, with public health going forward. But other government agencies I've heard of are not opening till after Labor Day, interestingly. So um, we obviously support your leadership and if we can assist with, you know, anything that we hear as different options, let us know. But in the meantime, we certainly have my full support because I know this is not easy. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie, for the feedback. Anyone else? No, it's uh, it, it sounds you know it's, you just have to have some flexibility. And if I you know can think of uh, some great idea for uh, allowing people to access some kind of a you know window I'll let you know but it sounds like you've got everything uh, well in hand thank you great okay thanks for the feedback all right um if there is anything else um I'll take a motion to adjourn so moved second uh I'll, I'll take a roll call vote all in favor Jackie yes Amy yes Mariano yes Susan? Yes. And yes for me, uh, motion carries five to zero unanimously. Thank you everyone, so long meeting, um, really appreciate it. Um, uh, and, I, and I think that we're um, on track for uh, our next Monday meeting to be uh, on the 29th, um, if that works for everyone. Sounds good. Can I just say happy Father's Day to the fathers? <laughs>